Vogel, shut the fuck up and take off your vest. You look like Aladdin. Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast, where we are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and talking movies. This is episode 160, and a very special one it is. I am your host, the Mayor Jeff Hornacek. And before we get started with the movie discussion and what is sure to be an incredible night of movie talk, let's go around and meet the fellow bros. Because of the special occasion, we have the full complement of gentlemen of the Bro4 Squad on pod tonight. So first, we begin with our legal counsel, Ronnie Cycli. Now, Ronnie, in the five years we've been doing this pod, you have been countersued by MGM Studios approximately three times. So if you could give them a message right now, what would you say? I would just ask simply, what is your record in, in those three suits? Just curious, you know, just let us know um, how your percentage is. I'm sure if it was baseball terms, it'd be, you know, what, zero, I think. I, I don't know baseball <laughs> statistics as well, but I think it's around zero. Yeah, they'd be like uh, the pitcher or any member of the Texas Rangers that plays every day. I'm surprised. MGM, you know, they're like the Chumbawamba song. They do keep coming back, but never with <laughs> It sticks in your head. <laughs> Marshall Erickson, which Chumbawamba song? Which Chumbawamba song? Come on. Next, we go to the American hero, Nate Thurman. Nate, in the legacy of the podcast, you have never once disagreed with a single take Brian Banner has had. How do you do it? Um... You know, that's a good question. I think, and and Banner can probably attest to this as well because he calls me out for it all the time. Um, off pod, I disagree with him a lot. So Literally kind of, <laughs> never takes my fucking side on anything. <laughs> and there's been plenty, yeah, plenty of camping trips and other trips with our significant others. So he calls me out all the time for it. So I, I try and be a little agreeable on pod just for as much shit as I give him off pod. It's only fair. If Brian were to, if we were to make like shirts for everyone, Brian's would say, "If I can just play devil's advocate, <laughs> just give me one second. That's what his T-shirt would say. <clears throat> Speaking of which, next we go in the lab to the mad scientist Brian Banner. Now, Banner, five years ago, you took the first dollar we made as a podcast and said you wanted to invest it to buy some science equipment. So I think now is a good time to revisit it at our five-year anniversary. What did you end up doing with that money? What money? You know, the, the $1 you took? Geiger wanted to hang it up in his office. You said, no, I have plans for this. Oh, that money. Hey, hey don't say anything else. Don't incriminate yourself. You're good. Plead the fifth. <laughs> I let him, let plead him the fifth, according to my legal counsel. Whose side are you on, Cycli? The people who have the money. Oh. But he, he probably doesn't, based on his... <laughs> <laughs> All right, last we go in the paint to our enforcer, Matt Geiger. Geiger, what is your record in street balls, brawls, excuse me, in the past five years, if you had to estimate? Um, undefeated. If I had to estimate, <laughs> undefeated. What about Roughly. street balls? Yeah, how about street balls? How are you doing there? Uh, three, two, and one. I think my favorite... Uh, part- like, street balls almost. also can tie like the NFL. So very com- Overtime is very balls. complicated. I don't think yeah. we have enough time to get into it on this pod. <laughs> One time I remember we were out at a bar. This was probably like 10 years ago now. And Geiger almost had to fight a fellow Raiders fan who had a Raiders jersey on because that guy claimed that he knew the 53-man roster better than Matt Geiger. Absolutely love with that. I was like, when you start fighting yourself, that's when you know you're true Raiders fan. I'm not here to fight the Chargers. I'm here to fight the people actually with the silver and black. <clears throat> It's a beautiful thing. All right. Well, if you have not listened to our podcast before, we start every episode off with the most important thing in any bro's life, and that is our chest day segment. Now, this is a very special episode as we set off the top. As of today, I believe this should be dropping on September 21st, our podcast turns five years old and would essentially be starting kindergarten. So uh, yeah, we have our cubby hold and our... Can we take a picture of like the first day of school with our backpacks? <laughs> The podcast has made it farther in school than I ever did. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite the accomplishment. How many crayons has the podcast eaten already today is the real question. Uh, so with today's episode commemorating five years of the pod, we wanted to start off uh, our countdown, which will probably last uh, the whole year, I would imagine, of each of our top 100 movies of all time. And uh, 
these are lists that we've curated over, I mean, obviously the course of our lives, but I think specifically the past six months we've gotten serious about it. And then we'll end the podcast with a few of our favorite moments uh, from the show throughout the past five years. So, um, Nate, you and I actually did a little preview of, of our lists uh, on the last episode, episode 159. Why don't you give the people just a summary of what these lists are? Because they are not an AFI top 100 list is probably the one way I would describe it. Not even close. So this is really a summation of each one of our individualistic top 100s, and they are going to be very individual um, just going through mine, I, I know it's, I, I start to laugh at some of these, but then I really look at what the movies are and how they, what they mean to me or, or do they make me laugh or like anything else besides that. And there's a, there's, there's a personal touch to these. Um, like Jeff said, it's not going to be AFI top 100. Um, it's not going to be, there's plenty of probably classically great mute movies that are not in my 100. Um, and we're fine with that. These are our 100. And if anyone argues with us, we'll argue back and fuck you also. Yeah. Mine yeah, is get your own exactly podcast the same if you as wanna... the IMD, IMDb 100. <laughs> so just coincidence. I wasn't well, late the, to my assignment. Yeah, the, the lawyer is plagiarizing over there. That's it's like weird. we kind no. of forgot about it the last six months. So he just <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Geiger's like, I actually have all foreign films till we get to the 50s. Yeah. So You probably have never heard of any of these. <laughs> They're probably all British too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Boy, at least bro. half, yeah. Foreign silent films. All right, so today we're going to count down our 100 through number 96 films, so essentially the first five. And again, as long as we can justify these, uh, they belong on our list. So we'll go snake draft style. Matt Geiger, we begin mm-hmm. in the paint with you. What is your number 100 movie of all time? All right, well, Jeff tried to text me drunk and give me, and I switched these up a little bit. To kick it off, number 100 is the original Austin Powers. The original Ooh. Austin Powers. The original Austin Powers, which which should get you to stay tuned on some of the comedies I have. You'll probably see a couple more in my top five. But, man, if, if there's a comedy that really says the 90s, I believe it's this film. Um, this was before Mike Myers playing, like, four roles was annoying to us. It, it actually was kind of creative at this time. Yeah. Not many people have done it besides, I think, Eddie Murphy did it a little bit. And... It's just fucking hilarious. Like the premise of it, how he's basically a James Bond and they basically Ted Williams fucking freeze him in case one person <laughs> comes right. back. Dr. Evil, not a more a more evil person, maybe in the 90s, but the exact same fucking person because he's the only one that can beat him. And then he comes back in the 90s and it's not the 60s anymore. And he just wants to have sex all the time and free love and his teeth are all fucked up and he doesn't understand it. <laughs> it's Elizabeth Hurley is fantastic in this, too. Um this is where Seth Green, everyone thought he was annoying until he got in these films and people thought he was actually not a great actor, but a pretty good comedy actor. I do. Love I, Scott, I fucking please. love. And Scotty. just to tell you, none of the other ones made my top 100. This one is my favorite one. The scene where he's and you know me as a Vegas freak, where he's at blackjack and number two already has 21 and Austin Powers has five and he stays <laughs> is like I like crack up every fucking I two. also like to live, like dangerous. to live dangerously. <laughs> and only that the movie holds up. I mean, 100 it does is it, just as hilarious today than it was 20. Whatever I still think ago. it's funnier than the second one, even with mini me. And I get that that's really funny. But the first one to me is the best. Not the great thing about that. Austin Powers is, like, conceptually, it is a spoof movie, but I think it, like, unlike so many spoof movies that followed where they just collapse in on, like, okay, but what actually is your, hum- like, the humor sensibility, aside from just, like, parodying something? It's funny even if you've never seen a James Bond movie. Yeah. Like, it doesn't it, depend on that at all. And, Jeff, you know this because my dad is obsessed with James Bond. <laughs> It was really hard for him to admit he loves Austin Powers because <laughs> he hated it. He wanted to be like, this is so insulting to my fandom. And you would see him laugh and you'd be like, oh, yep, nope, you're liking it. And he's like, fine, I guess it's funny. And Cycle has somehow managed to squeeze this quote into our everyday vernacular. I get it. I have bad teeth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and his when he pees after he's frozen is like the funniest fucking thing. Because you would have to piss so fucking bad. Yeah. yeah. Evacuation. 40 years. <laughs> There's so many great one-liners, like when he's in the bathroom. Who does number two work for? <laughs> there's there's so many times, like, I'll be at a concert or a football game, and I'll just take a long piss, and, like, if my friend's beside me, I'll be like, evacuation, come 
Well, <laughs> he's good. Okay, great. Him movie. denying the penis enlarger is his, too. It's your yeah. <laughs> Honestly, book, someone's playing a prank on me, man. That's not mine. It's like in his It's stuff. my bag, baby. <laughs> Austin Powers endorsed manual to the penis that's enlarger. How we, that's how we kick off a top 100 list. That's a good No one else eight. would have Austin Powers as a top 100 greatest film of all time. Oh, I, I, I do have it in my list, I will say. I'm sure you oh, do. Yeah. Yeah. It'll pop up again. It's all right, good stuff. stuff. Cycli, what's your number 100 movie of all time? So... You've heard me on the podcast a thousand times. Big, big horror fan. Um, I've and, and Jeff, you and I have talked about this plenty off pod. My my list is have it's been a living list. It's it's been really hard to just have it be secure. So I keep moving things around, but I think I feel pretty confident um, because I love horror so much. I, I I kind of separated the the movies into categories and then broke them down into my favorites and then pushed them back together. So what I have as my number 100 is the original Omen. The mm-hmm. Omen from 1976, Gregory Peck, fantastic actor. Um, and, and the reason is for me to have this at 100 is it's, you know, I don't know if it's held up as well as like, let's say an Austin Powers in the comedy genre. But to me, what this movie symbolized and what it did for, like it brought a serious actor into the horror game. And it, that really wasn't too much of a thing, you know, that was always separated. You didn't want to be a part of that. And Gregory Peck taking this role um, was it just a massive achievement. And it was a, and it, it's a it's one of my favorite movies in terms of just like the nostalgia of it. They tried to bring back the omen in 2006, if you guys recall, when on mm-hmm. 06, 06, 06, 06. Yeah, um, didn't hold up. But I do love the attempt on the date of the 666. <laughs> but uh the movie itself, I, I think it, it does, as for a 70s horror film, um, considering it, uh, it holds up, and I think it's one that everyone needs to see, especially if they consider themselves horror uh, lovers. And the It's All For You, I, I am Damien, a horror lover. lover. I, I love that scene. And she just it's jumps off and Probably a top herself. five creepiest scene of all time in yeah. a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> and the kids freak out when he gets to church, just absolutely screaming. Mia Farrow's creepy in it. Yeah, the whole thing about it. Uh, and then, yeah, like you said, Gregory Peck, I mean, the dude from To Kill a Mockingbird in it. Like, yeah, you know. it, but if you really study the film, it's, it, it's crazy that he did it. Now, it, kind of like Austin Powers, it, it did spurt off a trilogy. Um, surprisingly, I don't think many people have seen the Omen 2 and 3. Um, the, the it second follows one, Damien growing up, right? Yeah, it, second one is he, when he's a teenager in school, and the third one when he's a, he's a politician. But those did not hold up as well as, as this one, and... Um, but yeah, this definitely needed to make my top 100, and I think it was perfectly placed at the number of 100. Good. I'm expecting uh, you to represent the horror genre for us. I have a good list. Yeah, you need to pick up my slack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. next up, the American hero, Nate Thurman. What is your, and I know you were tweaking this up until the 11th hour, like a South oh, yeah. Park episode. So what is your number 100 movie of all time? <laughs> this is one I almost guarantee is not on anyone else's. Um, and this snuck in there surprisingly. I didn't know it was going to be at 100, but uh, I'm not sure what year this came out. Now that I'm, I was going to set this up, but the comedy with Paul Rudd and Jennifer Aniston, Justin Thoreau, Wanderlust. Wanderlust, nice. Wanderlust wow. coming in at a hundred. Um, really underrated. Not many people talk about it. I think it's fucking hilarious. Um, and I'm just a huge Paul Rudd fan in general, so. Um, the, him and Jennifer Aniston together work well. Um, there's a small aspect of like a little stepbrothers feel because he has an older douchebag brother in this as yes. well. <laughs> and they've got some some great scenes in there and the, and shows you pretty quickly that he's even offspring some douchebag kid. Um, but uh, him and I mean, one of the funniest comedic short scenes that always pops into my head is him and Melinda Ackerman whenever they're going to have sex, like (laughs) him coming up with all that shit of like ways to (laughs) kind of pronounce Dick. It like kills me and like him practicing in the mirror. It's it's amazing. The outtakes of it, Paul Rudd, like just, it, it it reaches a point of insanity where he's like, even I can't keep a straight face here. (laughs) She's my dick. I'm I'm going to fuck you. I'm going to fuck you. I'm going to fuck you. <laughs> He's like looking at himself in the mirror, trying to psych himself up. Uh, but um, as a thing you'll see throughout my 100, and I'm sure everyone else's, is uh, pretty pretty comedy heavy. Um, obviously, a ton of other stuff in there. But uh, yeah, that's the one that shook out to 100, Wonderlust, and I'm sticking with it. I'll admit, I've never seen it. 
It's a good one. That's what I said. It's, it's underrated. Not not many people will go out of their way to see it. Um, but if you get the chance, it's definitely worth your time. And I could be wrong, but that might be where Justin Thoreau and Jennifer Aniston actually met as well. I believe so. Yeah. I believe they Just, were. Justin Thoreau is a really underrated comedic actor. Like in Your Highness as the wizard, he's incredible oh. also. Parks and Rec does a great job in his five or six episodes he's in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, Brian Banner, what is your number 100 movie of all time? Uh, before we get to number 100, I just need to throw this out here. Um, number 128 is Abe Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. What? Thank you very much. Wow, didn't even <laughs> sniff the list. That's going to okay. be on the director's cut where we have our top 200. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that I did take this list seriously. And I didn't just throw. No, it's your list. If you can, I was just about to say. But with that being said, (laughs) I went off of when I made my list. It was how much did I like the movie? How much am I I entertained by the movie? I am not in any way saying this is a good movie by any means. On some, Brian goes. This list isn't a joke. Okay, my number one hundred is Transformers: Dark of the Moon. (laughs) I wish. It's higher on the list uh no number 100 is kingsman secret service very wow. first nice i mean it's just a good movie it surprised the hell out of me great action great choreography uh good writing the villain i thought was really good sam jackson i think he does what makes a good villain is you kind of empathize with them you kind of you get where they're coming from, whether you would agree or disagree. Uh, it was funny. It had it, it really just checked all the boxes um, for me. Great movie. Anytime it's on, I'm gonna stop and watch. Haven't seen it. Love the villain. Hated his lisp. Got to say that. Uh yeah, I'll agree with that. But you know, he had to do like something. What? Did he have to have a lisp? I think so. And that that scene in the church might be one of the best, oh. one of the best choreographed special effects fight scenes I've ever seen in my life. Did yeah. you? Did and Guy thought. Also, go ahead. The one. I was no, gonna I was say gonna, I enjoyed the second one as well. Yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Not as good as the first one, but. Did solid. you ever think he was supposed to have a limp and there was just a typo at one point? Mm. That wouldn't make sense. That's it. That, that's my Matthew dumb Vaughn, input. Three months into the shootings, like you know what? I it did say limp. Now that I think about it. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll have to go watch that one. Get D and L mixed up. All I right, that, right. <laughs> the Kingsman Secret Service. As I'm writing this down. Okay, my number one hundred movie, and I I when I first saw that this was only clocking in at one hundred, I was like, damn, maybe my list is more stacked than i thought uh but it is the 1993 classic the sandlot which of course we've all seen i'm sure yep. has a special place in all of our hearts oh, yeah of course just a slice of americana and i don't know if there's a scene uh that moves me to tears as much as the fourth of july scene where they play the game under the lights with the fireworks and america oh america <laughs> plays uh ham porter of course was like a character growing up that we all quoted to death like you're killing me smalls and yeah you play ball like a girl and just the way he would talk shit to the opposing team behind the plate is that your sister in left field <laughs> naked strike <laughs> three <laughs> what what ham did porter i say was, ham porter was a little bit of all of us uh and smalls was a little bit of all of us and i know geiger and i have gone back and the more that you watch it the more we love um Dennis Leary's character as the stepdad. Great, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Fucking shoves like a fastball at Smalls and gives him a black eye. He's like, you should have got your glove up. I don't know what to tell Porking you. Porking his mom. You know, then goes on a business him. trip and porks his assistant. Matt, he's working. What a life. <laughs> it's in the job description. <laughs> <laughs> but Sandlot. Especially in the 60s, they couldn't say anything. No. This is a different time. <laughs> so yeah. Sandlot clocks in at number 100. When. <laughs> That's the fun thing about putting this list together. Like, if you would ask me before we did this, hey, where would Sandlot be in your top 100? I'd probably be like, it's probably like a top 30 movie. But when you actually look at 
what's ahead of it? I'm like, no, I mean, that's where it slides in. Barely cracks it, but it is a film I love. And I got to say, it's a movie I've seen a lot. Like, I've probably seen mm-hmm. Sandlot like 10 or 15 times. Yeah. All right, Solid. Let's, let's do Snake Order. So my number 99 movie, I have a feeling this will be a popular one on the pod, is the 2011 film The Lincoln Lawyer. Oh, I love it. Yep. Starring Matthew McConaughey. Which, of course, led to a series of Lincoln commercials after the fact. <laughs> but this was uh, probably right. the start or like maybe a year into the McConaissance, right? Like when he was starting to be taken as a very serious actor. Yeah. Um, yeah. We started to realize that, okay, he's not just going to do rom-coms with like Kate Hudson and Sarah Jessica Parker where he can't get his life back together. He actually has some really good dramatic chops. And the story in this one is just incredible. Ryan Phillippe, Marissa Tomei. Um, the idea that he's a lawyer who has had too many DUIs, so he literally has to have someone just drive him around in a Lincoln while he's still working cases is kind of a cool concept in and of itself. And then you give Matthew McConaughey just plenty to chew on, and you throw Brian Cranston in there just for good measure. This yeah. must have been – like, when was where was Breaking Bad at in 2011? Like early seasons? I think early seasons, yeah. So you get Cranston sort of like right. just as an up and comer as well. Him and McConaughey, like probably good buy low candidates yeah. for this movie as dramatic actors. But uh, I won't spoil anything in it, but a, a phenomenal third act. And the Lincoln Breaking Lord, Bad was entering its like third season. So like really where Breaking Bad started making it, you know, going crazy. Nice. Uh, again, the cast is just pretty stacked too. Michael Pena, William H. Macy, John Leguizamo, Cranston. I mean... Marissa Tomei, as we mentioned, so great, great film, very rewatchable, and if you have not seen The Lincoln Lawyer, I highly recommend it. If uh, you haven't read the book, it's a great book, too. It's also okay, four, four others after that. If you're In curious. a book. In a book. There's four books after The Lincoln Lawyer? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the four literally lawyer, the only the yeah, lawyer. <laughs> the only, the like, thing lawyer. that connects them is the fact that he is the Lincoln lawyer. Other than that, it's completely different cases, and it's a lot of fun. Let's check that out. All right, uh, Brian, back to you. What's your number 99 movie of all time? Number 99, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I believe this was the very first movie we ever did a Bro 4 Squad review on, me and Matt, uh, Magnificent Seven, the oh, 2016 movie. remake. Uh, talk about a stacked cast, guys. Denzel, Pratt. Ethan Hawke, D'Onofrio. I mean, it's... Let's go on. Haley Bennett's in this. Skarsgård is in it. Oh, wow. We... This is... It's just a good, fun movie. I mean, it's... Group of guys... Yeah, I think so. Saw it in New Orleans after Popeye Jones' wedding. Fun fact. In theaters with my wife. That's right. There you go. Uh, As far as remakes go, guys, I mean, this is a... One that I would argue is a better than the original uh, Woo! movie. And the original is fantastic, too, if you haven't seen that. Yeah. I remember seeing this movie, and I don't remember much about it. I remember it's me good. not really being a fan of it. Maybe I'll need to go back and rewatch it. But first watch, I, I didn't like it for some reason. I think the plot device in it, which, again, it is a remake, but it has spawned so many great movies of, like, Town gets taken over. Let's put together our ragtag group of people to take the town back. Yep. Like even a Mandalorian episode this last season took a page out of the book, right? Just because it works so well, especially in the Western genre. Yeah. It is. Oh, for sure. It is exactly how a Western should be made. Like that's what a Western should be should be built around. And this was Pratt. Let me see when Guardians of the Galaxy came out, but this was like, yeah, two years before. So this is like. Chris Pratt striking while the iron's hot, capitalizing mm-hmm. on it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Hot Chris Pratt. All right, Nate, what's your number 99? Number 99. Um, all right, so moving down the list, I feel like I'm, I'm probably going to like justify things throughout this whole list. And the way this was put together, I feel like you could take any 10 – chunk of 10 movies and you can kind of interchange them because you get to this point where you're like ah, is that one better than this one uh, it's, it's kind of it's like all the seven through ten iffy. The NCAA tournament like yeah 
kind of interchange them. Um, but this is actually one I saw actually fairly recently. Had, hadn't watched it. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, this is another one I doubt is going to be on anyone else's top 100. But Ready Player One. Wow. Yeah, anyone not, seen definitely not going to be on my top 100. No. Yeah, Banner's the only one that has Jesus a shot. Jesus Christ. You didn't like Ready Player One? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, let's hear, let's hear your argument against it. Banner hates it. Can Jesus. we do a bottom 100? <laughs> Have mine ready to go if you need to. Yeah. I was waiting for Banner to. It is currently 382 on my list. <laughs> hey, that's better than 383. Hey. Okay, what's 383, Banner? 383 is the Lego movie. What? <laughs> no, that's insulting. The Lego movie. Oh my fantastic. god, I like the first Lego movie. <laughs> Brian, so that's 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 how you're gonna argue this one? Jesus Christ. No, I think it fucking sucks. I think Ty Sheridan is one of the worst actors in fucking Hollywood. Wow. Ever. I kind of agree with that. Yeah, I think he fucking sucks. I think... He's going to be on the pod next week also. Yeah, yeah, and I'll tell him that that. he fucking sucks there too. That's like actually meant to tell you guys. I talked to his agent. He's coming on. Kind of a big fucking deal, but... Just for reference, number 383 on my list is Little Giants. So... (laughs) Which I kind of like. Yeah. Um, No, I thought it was a fun, futuristic kind of VR gamer movie. Um, It kept me entertained i didn't i had put off watching it for so long because i was like oh, i don't think i'll like it and then i actually watched it and i was like yeah it's actually not too bad and then i like horrible taste in movies okay <laughs> that's fine banner have you read the book is that why you're coming at it like this uh it's part of it i tried to go into it with an open mind but they changed pretty much the entire fucking movie yeah and that's like of course yeah because of the oh point. if that's why you hate it, i don't care i haven't well, read the book <laughs> This is Thurman's number 99 movie, and basically we're all shitting on it. He hasn't said anything about what he likes about it. No. Well, I was it's trying to get Banner's view of why he didn't like it. Jesus. Well, no, we already and, buried it, so. Oh, that's fine. I didn't I didn't think that the acting was super bad, and I really liked the addition of Ben Mendelsohn in it. And, I didn't mind it. Yeah. And his, his, his evil character wasn't too bad in it. Um, I like him from obviously Star Wars and Outsiders and all that kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think it's a great cinematic piece of film. But you don't I, gotta sell yourself here, man. It's a safe place. It kept, it kept me entertained. It's your list. Exactly. Don't let Banner just influence you. It kept me entertained. I thought Own it was a fun it. movie. Fuck you. Banner. I haven't seen it, but the premise to me is kind of cool. Like uh, someone dies and leaves this Easter egg in this virtual world that the winner mm-hmm. who collects it gets something, and it's filled with. Like pop culture Easter eggs, like to me that's kind of cool. From yeah, the it's 80s. not in my one top yeah. 100, but it, I enjoyed it, so I'll get you back on this. Yeah, yeah, it, it kind of brings in the whole Easter egg thing, and you're having to go through the games to find these three big, um, three big cocks. Easter eggs. Yeah, that that oh three big cocks. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different movie. And oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is, Nate, isn't a portion of this centered on like people knowing people only virtually, like not in the real world, and sort of like the yeah, their their secrecy is a big part at the beginning. Obviously, that kind of breaks down as they d- develop friendships and things like that. But uh, just kind of the aspect of them being virtual online and not wanting to know their real names and things like that and the secrecy. Um, but then, like I said, as their friendships develop and they actually – spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen it – meet in real life and uh, and go on from there. So, you're like, You don't look like your profile picture. Yeah, you're way hotter. Because <laughs> that's how it always works out. <laughs> yeah. All right, Cycli, what's your number 99 movie of all time? Uh, so it is, uh, I'm a big fan of the original movies of these. Um, Kevin Smith in the 90s was much better than ke- current Kevin Smith, I will say. I have two mm-hmm. movies of the Jane Silent Bob uh, genre in my top 100, and everyone can probably guess the number, like not number one, but the one that's going to be ranked much higher. But this one is the second one. It's probably my, it is my second favorite of his movies. It's Small Rats, uh, the 1995 comedy. Oh yeah, uh, Matt Damon and and Ben Affleck make decent. Uh, or Matt, uh, ben Affleck makes a great cameo in this, but J- uh, obviously we get Jason Lee and and Jane Silent Bob in this. And if you go back to me, it's it absolutely holds up. It's when Kevin Smith was still making movies for people who felt like they didn't really belong, and it gave them a little bit of an outlet. It was better than Clerks, but it's Clerks wasn't something to introduce them to this kind of comedy that takes place in the whole movie takes place over two hours. And so it's about two guys just hanging out at a mall, right? Like there's no reason this movie should be as good as it is. Um, and to me, it completely holds up. And I don't think some of his movies get as much respect as they can. I think this is a really is, is a top comedy. 
Um, now, obviously, he's made some better movies and he's made some much, much worse movies. But uh, Mallrats is always one of the comedies I remember first seeing and, and loving Jay and Silent Bob. Because when Jay and Silent Bob are good, they're good. Oh, yeah. This one, like I think some of Kevin Smith's best comedies, found like a second uh, life due to a cult following. Yeah. And it really has kind of lived on. I'm actually kind of surprised. And again, I haven't seen your list, but I thought this would be a little bit higher on yours just because I know yeah. you've spoken highly of it for a long time. I, I, it definitely is. I mean, I think my list, and, and you'll see as we go through this, kind of like, was it, Nate, you were talking about, or Jeff, are you talking about it? Like, you know, I thought it was going to be higher. Yeah, you were talking about Sandlot. And it was originally higher, and then you're putting it together, and then you realize that 100 is sounds like a lot, but it's really not. And thinking of them, all the movies we've seen in our lifetime. Um, so to be honest, I think we should all just say out loud, like, you know, anything in this list for any of us is a good fucking movie. Yeah. Brian already disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> Saying lots of on my list. Yeah, I mean, looking at the ones, Nate and I kind of talked about this last week when we did, like, our ones that barely missed the cut. But, like, when I had to look at some of the ones that I couldn't and could not squeeze in here, I was like, I thought I liked this movie a lot. And I do. But over the course of your life, 100 movies, again, is not that much. No. And, and no. everyone, this podcast, too, especially, Stan Lee has not just a cameo, a fantastic cameo in this movie. Where he actually gives love advice to Jason Lee's character. So, um, no, it, it, I, if you haven't watched it or it's been a long time since you've watched it, I highly recommend going and see Mallrats. On its own, it just stands up. It looks like it's streaming on Hulu. So, let me give it a poke. There we go. Hmm. All right, Geiger, you got two in a row here. What is your number 99 and then your number 98 movies of all time? All right, I'm going to go ahead and pop a top on my westerns. Get one out of the way. And this <laughs> is probably it. on no one's list, and especially Thurman's, which I think is a shame. You guys should all watch this, but it is Young Guns from the mm. 80s. Emilio, Charlie Sheen, Kiefer Sutherland in their fucking prime. I think this gets a bad rap since when it came out, and that it was like, a lot of people think it's a rat packy, but it's really not. It's a really good fucking Western, and you should watch it. It's on... um. Like I F C I F G a lot, which is a channel that shows movies in this entirety with no commercials. And it's very well done story about Billy, the kid and, you know, the regulator group. And I just fucking dig it, man. It's definitely um a top 10 Western for me. The sequel is very popular as well. I like the remember. sequel and especially with um Bon Jovi. It wasn't wanted dead or alive. it was a blaze of glory. The song they wrote for it. And it was a story that if you look it up, there was a guy in the 60s that claimed that he was Billy the Kid and went by his fake name and uh, Pat Garrett never killed him. That has been debunked. But when that movie came out, it was like a big like conspiracy theory that a lot of people bought into. So that makes that movie's just a little long for me and it kind of drags. This one's pretty good watch, especially you got Charlie Sheen's not in the second one and uh, Kiefer Sutherland is, but they kind of get him later. But this one is a very good film. It looks like uh, they added, or maybe replaced, but Christian Slater's in the second one. Christian Slater's in the second one. And the first one is, uh, I don't know the guy's name, but he's in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He's like the friend of Matthew Broderick. Okay. But, I see no, oh, and uh, shit, um, Lou Diamond Phillips from La Bamba. Yep. Fantastic in this yep. film. It is like, I mean, if you're a chick in the 80s, you'd watch this, but all the guys are like, I don't know, all the, like these guys are pretty fucking cool, and it's a Western. It's... It's well done. It's really worth a watch, especially if you're into those. Like, you know, I heard Banner talk about Magnificent Seven, and he probably hasn't seen this movie if he ever has in its entirety in like 10 years. I challenge you to watch it. This yeah, one has. I, I feel like I've seen it. It's just off. been a long, long time. This one's also on Hulu. Yeah, there you go. There we go. This also has, it looks like, it's Dermot uh, Moroni in it, who my wife yeah. drools over. Oh, okay. He's like the quintessential now, like, Good looking old dude. There you go. Yes. Uh, Dermot Maroney might pop up in a movie here very soon on my list. Uh oh. So, number 98, uh, we already talked about McConaughey. This is one where I think people really started taking him seriously as an actor. And this is probably on no one's list, too, but it's two for the money with him and Pacino, especially oh, yeah. with sports betting coming back. If you guys haven't seen this movie in a while, you guys know I love sports movies, but I love sports movies that aren't about like the sport like it's not like the team it's not a player well, it's, it's just the about sports for the betting story. around football 
Yeah. And uh, McConaughey was a former player, like he, you know, played like independent leagues and stuff. And then he's trying to get back in the league, but he's really good at handicapping. So Pacino has a basically a corporation in New York, hires McConaughey on, and then he gets like in with the Sharks with deep sports betting and stuff. It's a really good fucking film. Pivens in it, and he's like a total dick in it, which I love. And that's Renee Russo is the wife, and she's fantastic in it. Really good acting between him and Pacino, and that's where I'm like, dude, McConaughey can play in this fucking yard. He's a really good actor. I love Two for the Money, and I just looked it up on my list. It clocks in at number 224, yeah. just ahead of Homeward Bound. Ooh, there we go. Wow. <laughs> it's so weird. It's just so weird to go back and be like, how do I evaluate Two for the Money against Homeward Bound? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Piranha versus... Terrell Owens, like in your yeah. list of just cool things you've seen in your life. Like, how do you? Terrell Owens is at home. Like, for $8,000, I'd fight a piranha. Like, dude, we, we're not. It's a joke. But do it if you want. Good stuff. I totally fucking forgot about that movie, but nice. All right, Cycling, back to you. What's your number 98? So I've, I've talked about this movie a couple of times before on the podcast, and I've actually written about it on the blog. It is the movie Primal Fear uh, with Richard Gere and Edward right. Norton's cinematic debut. And that in itself um, is a reason to watch this movie because, as you might have heard me mention, if you haven't seen the movie, uh, Edward Norton is is absolutely incredible. There is no way you would watch this film and think this is his first film. Um, he, he was, um, he was uh, nominated for an Academy Award, or he should have won it. Um, oh, I didn't know be, he was nominated. Wow. Yeah, and, and that's I think it's a fun trivia. Like I don't know if anyone else has been nominated for an Academy Award in their first movie. I mean that's just unreal. So if you no, don't know the plot great. about it, he yeah. is a uh, altar boy working at a Catholic church. Um, the pre uh, the priest at that church is murdered. Um, Richard Gere's character is an attorney, and he ends up defending Edward Norton, who's being accused of that murder. The priest is very powerful in politics. Um, I, I always, Jeff, you and I always talk about this. I hate saying this because that's part of the, the it ruins it. But the twist in this movie is incredible. It's um, so good. Yeah. It's, it's one of the top twists of any movie. And I, I don't like telling people because then they're waiting for it. But this movie, again, 1996, isn't talked about as much as I thought. I've always told, said it's underrated. Um, it's a fantastic legal film, too. Uh, Pr- Primal Fear deserves to be in a top 100. And, uh, and, and to me, that I feel really strong about where it is. Yeah, I think I watched this within the past year also and a half on your on your uh, recommendation. And what do you think? Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, um, really great. Yeah, Edward Norton. I mean, does a fantastic job. I can't believe uh, it's his first I have movie. To say, Geiger's gonna watch this movie because Edward Norton is doing. He, it's like a Cajun accent, right? I've never seen this movie ever. <laughs> okay, but Geiger, so yeah. Geiger's gonna roll his eyes at the fucking kid because it's like. <laughs> He's doing a lot. <laughs> yeah. He's really fucking acting. <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> it's like you really, it's like Simple Jack. You really put that all out there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Really did a lot. But he, he, he goes like full cell with the Cajun accent. But uh, Francis McDormand also in it. Laura Linney. Yep. And again, on Hulu. <laughs> so That's on Hulu? Yeah, Hulu. Yeah, I actually, yeah. guys, I'm going to be, it was the Hulu Top 100. This is. <laughs> <laughs> Wait All a minute. All cycling ones. I'm like, that's Damn also it. on Hulu. Got, that's got weird. It's like the way you're wearing a Hulu has a live sports TV show. But, no. Is, I got it for free. Don't worry about it. I'm sure you did as part of a sponsorship deal. <clears throat> All right, Nate, what is your number 98 movie? Um, man, 90, 99 is as far as I got. Guys, I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm um, waiting for two of us to have the same movie at the same number. That when you said top correct. 100, I thought you meant just the literal top 100. <laughs> the top 100 spot. He just got lucky and had a few sitting yeah. around that he could use. So, um, Number 98. And this will show you how hodgepodge and random and all over the place my list is. Um, I think. This might be in someone else's top 100. I'm not sure. But the uh, recent World War One movie, 1917. Cracked the top. Wow, one. I love it. I'm fine. Yeah. Um, so obviously, one of the big things about this is like the way it was shot. One, they try to do a whole one shot movie, which you can't do that. But they, I, th- I thought they pulled it off great. Um, 
and the way that they shot it, they made it sh- they had to make sure that they had the right angles and right cuts so they could, hey, we need to run this back. Okay, we know where the spot is and all this kind of stuff. So a lot of thought and effort went into that, and it made the movie flow differently than any other movie. Um, and there aren't too many big World War One movies out there that a lot of people are into or, or recognize for. Um, so this really put a World War One movie like into some good recognition with people. Um, and at the end of the day, the whole movie is a very simple story. It's, hey, we need this message to go from here to here. You need to do it. That's basically it. But the way it was shot, the cinematography of it, um, it kept the story moving and it kept kept it going and it didn't seem slow at any point. There's a ton of action in it. Um, you're in the trenches starting out, which gets it off like – gets you feeling claustrophobic you're like in the heat of the moment with everyone um and then it pretty much continues throughout the whole movie um but yeah really really great world war one movie uh which is kind of the forgotten war as it's as it's called now nate this uh obviously got a lot of oscar love it's directed by sam mendes who did a bunch of the bond movies Mm -hmm. like the new daniel craig ones and i can remember there was some visual like nuance that it had was it kind of film to look like it was done in one shot or it was am i misremembering that yeah did i, did I miss that at the beginning no, you said i thought that. i said that okay oh, yeah sorry yeah <laughs> i heard you talking about visual style i didn't know if you said there was so no cut. but nate i think the thing is it, it does look like it's filmed in one shot but what's impressive about it is i think it was actually just three to five. Oh, was that i didn't know what it I was mean, they, they, there was a crazy. couple of cuts in the movie where I, I remember watching going like that's probably where one was because it went like yeah. dark Really quick You're going through. Was, there's one big point where it does go dark. Not a spoiler. Someone blacks out. Yeah. Um, that, but, yes, that's definitely a cut. Yeah, that's definitely a cut. And then yeah, you go through the whole movie. You're like, is this where they may have pieced in a cut or something? Uh, but yeah, and like I said, this is part of the reason. I mean, it's a great film just in general. I like the story and the action of the whole thing. But part of the reason I cracked my top 100 is because it was supposed to be shot in that one shot mentality and that one shot uh, focus. Um, I thought they did a fantastic job of it. And, like, talk about an all-British cast. I mean, Richard Madden, who, of course, is Rob Stark in my favorite show, Game of Thrones. You got Benedict Cumberbatch, Mark <laughs> Strong. Colin also in Firth. Game of Thrones, as you know. Who? Yeah. All, all of them. <laughs> all of them? That's yeah. right. Benedict Cumberbatch and Mark Strong. If you're English, you're in Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. You were at least an episode. If Finn Jones can be in Game of Thrones, then they're just letting anyone walk on set. Finn Jones and who was was it Aaron Rodgers? Who was the NFL player? Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers was in it. Ed Sheeran was Aaron in it. Ed Sheeran, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like That's a funny. joke. Gosh. I'm uh, good. I'm glad we had some recent stuff represented. All right, Banner, what's your number 98? So, good start. Yeah. Uh, I just gave nate a ton of shit for having ready player one we knew this was going to come around i know at some point. <laughs> i know i been waiting this is one of those movies where i wanted to hate it so bad and i sat there with my arms crossed matt geiger style the entire fucking movie until the end and was like man i really fucking like that and that's jumanji welcome to the jungle okay i thought it was something else <laughs> <laughs> yeah Jesus I, Christ. I just had a ton of fun watching it. I don't know. Like I said, it kept me entertained. Is it a good movie? Not even fucking close. It's not even the best Jumanji movie. Nate, he can't complain about your movies ever no. again. I, no. I don't have any worries over here. I'm fine. We're good. Yeah, I just, I'm sorry. I had a ton of fun in it, and I liked it. I tried so hard to put it lower on the list, and I just, I couldn't somehow. I gotta say, I really loved. Like, I tried to hate it too, but I love Jack Flex, like being a fourteen-year-old girl. I know it's it's like that undrafted so rookie that's just good at special teams. Like he's gonna get a jersey. <laughs> he worked his way on the team. You got to put him in the hundred. I haven't seen it honestly. I'll be honest on that one. Banner, your list is gonna make me want to do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> just so I can understand it. It's like listening imagine, to like certain bands, or like you got to be high to even listen to it, or you're gonna think it's terrible. Imagine telling <laughs> someone you think the Jumanji with Jack Black is a top 100 film of all time, like in just a casual conversation. It's tough. It's tough. So <laughs> it's the person impressive. probably asks, like, "Have you seen only 100 movies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you capped out at 100? Yeah. 
I mean, I liked it, but, but let me see where it's at on my list, actually, because when you said it's not even the top Jumanji movie, uh, it's 666 on my list. <laughs> oh, Mark wow. of the Beast. Yep. <laughs> not a coincidence. All right, but Boehner, that's what we expected from you and what the pod needs you to do on here is... Look, I'm calling how I see him, guys. I call it's him like how a I see Mike him. Mayock, John Gruden reach in round one. Jesus Christ. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> He was Can high on all the, our board. Is the original Matt. Jumanji on your list? Uh, somewhere, yeah. I'm, let me let me see where. Like on your top 100 list? Uh, uh, top 1,000. Let's see. Okay. It has to be in your top 100. If, if, if this movie is Rob ranked Williams above, is dead for Christ's sake. Yeah. This soul's gonna haunt you if you don't have that. Show, one show some respect. It, it is. It is higher in the top 100. Okay. 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 There's some justice to be served. <laughs> All right, my number 98 is the aforementioned Dermot Moroni movie, and that is the 2005, uh, I wouldn't say it's a rom-com, it's more of a holiday romantic movie, The Family Stone. Who here has seen this? It's good. Mm. Yeah, love The yeah. Family Stone. Dermot so, Moroni, so Claire Danes. shaking his head. You don't like The Family Stone? I've never seen it. Oh, okay. oh he hasn't seen it, okay. Craig yeah. T. Nelson, Luke Wilson, Diane Keaton, Sarah Jessica Parker. Uh it's a once a year watch around the holidays for me. It's basically about a pretty large family. Diane Keaton is the matriarch and uh, Craig T. Nelson is her husband. All their kids, you know, come from varying uh, success and failures in their adult life. And they always obviously all come home for Christmas. And Dermot Maroney brings uh, his girlfriend, who that family has not met in Sarah Jessica Parker home. And he's planning on proposing to her and hijinks ensue. And it's sort of about like their, Dealing with each other, and there's a reveal that sort of happens, something that's going on within the family that uh, kind of brings up some issues where they all have to confront. But it's just very real, and to me, it just helps you around the holidays realize, you know, the important thing is getting to see your family and, you know, the people that you care most about, getting to spend that time with them while you have it. And the cast is just incredible. Luke Wilson's character is sort of like the fuck-up brother. And there's a scene in it where they all go out to, like, the bar, you know, like, they want to show them their local watering hole. And, of course, Luke Wilson gets shit-faced and, you know, hilarity ensues. But to me, it's just, uh, like, a, it's like comfort food, this movie. You watch it every year around Christmas. It makes you feel good. It's low rent. And it there's really nothing that happens in it as far as a romantic movie where you're like, okay, that's fucking stupid. Like, the dog doesn't run through the cake. You know, <laughs> like... Nothing absurd like that happens to where you just kind of roll your eyes. Um, and it's just something that I've always found myself sort of coming back to. It's just a good piece of filmmaking. So The Family Stone, number 98. 98. My number 97, Cycle, you will love this one. I think you actually turned me on to this movie and the concepts and the ideas and just the world that it's in and Natalie Portman's head being shaved all had me obsessed with it. And that is the 2005 film V for Vendetta. Mm-hmm. Starring Hugo Weaving, just even though he's masked the entire movie, this is like a balls out performance as V. And I would say one of the most underrated performances of probably anyone's career because no one talks about it. And he's absolutely incredible. Um, Banner, I know it's a graphic novel. Was it is it a book at all? Either. Do you know? I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't read either. I think it's just a graphic novel, but don't quote me on that. Wasn't it DC? I no. think it was. Uh, I want to say it was Dark Horse. Okay. Hmm. I knew it was like a brand that I've heard of before. Um. Yeah. It's it's like one of those one-off graphic novels that doesn't really. It was DC. Anything, but essentially, yeah, it was. It was. Yep. It was DC. Screenplay by the Wachowskis. Oh, nice. Yeah. So the cast is really just like a who's who of like British uh, stars. We have Stephen Fry. John Hurt, Natalie Portman, Hugo. Natalie Portman isn't British, but she, of course, plays a British person in it. Hugo Weaving. It's essentially um, sort of a dystopian future in the UK where, um, I don't know, Cycle, how would you describe the government? It, it is a dictatorship, but it's yeah, under like the guy. Totalitarian, the fascist, kind of. Yes. Like, sort of like 1984. Like, you can't have books and, you know, no one's allowed to have butter. Which, Lots of propaganda. Right. Um, and V is a terrorist slash freedom fighter. Again, it's all like kind of perspective based. 
And the movie follows. Uh, he announces to the government that in one year on November 5th, he's going to blow up parliament, essentially um, destroying the current government in place. And the whole movie is sort of that year in between of him um, working to set up this this attack and the government trying to hunt him down and figure out who he is. Remember the 5th of November. Yeah. Yes. The gunpowder treason and rot. It's really just visually it is stunning. And I mean, I think it's just a movie that is like so unique in what it does and just fucking captivating. Like there's really not even the, the scenes of dialogue. You're just like locked in and it's two hours, 12 minutes. And I would say probably feels like 40 minutes because it's that much fun. With an awesome climax and great performances. And again, Natalie Portman shaving her head really confused me sexually. <laughs> this is a weird boner I have. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what's happening? Okay. It's just it's surprising to me that her, this... Or do I want to pick her for the fifth guy on shirts and skins basketball? <laughs> both. Both, it's yeah. Always both. Yeah. <laughs> Why can't it be both? I, I'm, I'm surprised this movie isn't as talked about in general. Um, because mm-hmm. it has everything that you would think of an iconic movie from, especially in the mid two thousands. Um, it is a fantastic film. It is on my list. I'm glad you brought I it up. I think kids know that, uh, what's that internet group that wears the mask? Oh, oh anonymous. anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even think they, a lot of kids know that's from that movie. Yeah. Like I when I probably. see they're not, they're like, Oh, those are anonymous masks. I'm like, dude, that's from V from Vendetta. They just basically stole it basically. <laughs> yeah. The guy Fox. And actually the, the movie opens with, Guy Fawkes' original um, like terrorist plot where he moved – and Cycli, correct me if I'm wrong. That's true, right, what he did where he moved the, the bombs? Yeah. Guy Fawkes okay. is a real character, yeah. That that base in the November 5th plot is, is real. Mm-hmm. Cool. And what did he do again? He moved, like, explosives underneath uh, – was it like the – Yeah, he attempted a bomb some... parliament. Didn't quite he, he's always been kind of a controversial figure in, in general in this movie, or in, in real life. He's always used as, outside of this movie, he's used in protests all across the world. Um, you'll see protests in all third world countries and things like that, people wearing the mask, especially to protect yeah. themselves, but as a symbolic um, force against, you know, just governments that are too oppressive. Yeah, so V for Vendetta, my number 97. All right, uh, Banner, what is your number 97 movie of all time okay with 98 i got a little off track there uh so right in the ship a little bit number 97 uh game night 2018 um this is just a really really good movie i think it really benefited from when it came out we were on kind of a uh comedy comedies were weren't very good you know for a few years before and haven't really been for a few years after this is one Really good shining spot in the late uh, 2010s, I would say. Um, just a really good, fun, fast-paced, funny movie. Uh, it's really all, all there is to say about it. Uh, great cast, too. Uh, you got Bateman, Rachel McAdams, uh, Jesse Plemons, Michael C. Hall is in it. Just Chandler, right? No. Uh, Kyle <laughs> Chandler? Yeah, the guy from Friday Night Lights. He was fucking hilarious in it. Jesse yeah. Plemons steals a fucking show. Steals <laughs> the like show. So the funny. weird guy you don't want to invite. Yeah. Uh, but it just, yeah, it just struck a chord. And like I said, it came at a time when we really needed a good comedy. And it, it delivered. It did not disappoint. I want to say this was one of the last date nights that me and the wife had before Baby Banner was born. Wow. So also kind of drives that number up or, or drives that movie up on the list a little just because of the uh, events that were happening around it. And you'll yeah. definitely see that through probably all of our lists that some of these movies you're like, really? You like that movie? But it's because it reminds There's us a of story something behind college it. Yeah. or something significant in our life. Yeah, For sure. Yeah, Jesse Plymouth did a g- great job in this. I love the weird guy being a cop. So he's an authoritative figure. So yeah. you kind of kind of want to respect him, but then you're yeah. kind of always like, he's a weird shit who just got divorced and he's unstable. We can't have him over, but then ends up playing playing a big role. So in the what are Jeff's favorite quotes too? And it was like, how would that be profitable for Frito Olay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Corporations, right? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever he says. Well, do you have four bags of Tostitos? <laughs> 
It's like so fucking suspicious. Him <laughs> always holding that little dog too. It was just incredible. Got one, get three free. Uh, Duh. That's a uh, great one. Solid installment there, Banner. All right, Nate. Ninety-seven. What, what you looking at? Ninety-seven. So um, four in, and we're going kind of across the board on genres here. So uh, ninety-seven clocks in Joker for me. Joaquin wow. Phoenix, Todd Phillips directed. 2019 film i believe something like that just came out not too long ago um but really great take on the joker um pretty heavy severe violence in it which i mean coming from the the darkest joker we'd seen heath ledger it pretty much takes that to a new level um a very disturbed soul going through life trying to figure out um part of his who who his father is he has he can get attached to people very attached to his mother um gets very attached to robert de niro's character through television um fantasizes a lot um but then there's just dark funny aspects of it of like his day job as a clown and then him trying to be a stand-up comedian and those awkward as fuck moments while he's standing on stage trying to make them laugh and then his his disease or whatever they call it of him actually laughing and uncontrollably laughing, which plays into the whole Joker role. Um, but adds really interesting dynamics with the public and people in public situations. Um, and I always love, um, kind of like, um, us, um, with Jordan Peele, people who are Mm -hmm. traditionally maybe in comedic, uh, not roles, but, uh, comedic films or TV shows switching over and doing something. So Todd Phillips, um, has put out some great comedies and then him doing this. Um, I think through interviews and things like that, I've seen him and Joaquin Phoenix like really gelled and yeah. Joaquin Phoenix just being such a method actor and like this role being so in depth and like needing someone who can really get in the mind of a crazy person, which I think Joaquin Phoenix is just kind of crazy in general in real life. Um, it was the perfect fit for sure. And, and his role was fantastic, dark, demented and disturbing, but put all together for a great film. That might be the also, closest we have to I'm it's not on my list today, but Nate, we almost hit pretty close to naming the same movie in the same Oh really? Same day. Yeah. Oh wow. That was cool. cool. Also, how great is the meme? Like anytime someone makes a joke on Twitter that's just like not funny, <laughs> they tweet the picture of Walking Phoenix up on stage. Yeah. <laughs> with the book. Up. Yeah, with the book. And he's like looking at the crowd after the joke bombs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if y'all remember this, but I mean, I saw it opening weekend, but a lot of people thought the uh, movies were going to get shot up. Yes. I was oh, like, yeah. oh, because of that. Yeah. And uh, I know a lot of people, you know, nowadays are afraid to do anything, but me and my wife are there opening weekend. I'm like, eh, I, don't, I think we'll be yeah. fine. It, it, felt like did we see it, it, it almost made it more tense, like looking yeah, at the exit all out. the time, like, you know. What's this guy's deal in front of me? And if someone packing? would get up to piss, I'd be like, well, I don't know, man, you've been peeing a lot. What the fuck's up? Mm. I'm Sir? like, I'm sorry, I have a, I have a small bladder. Well, you came that. to the movie with me. Why are you suspicious? <laughs> I'll just say, Nate, too, like, uh, we were not doing best scene, but when he did the Robert Downey Jr. and actually killed him, I would say that was the most realist I've ever seen a movie look like someone getting shot. Like, you go to Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and, like, like okay, shoot, date. Like, that actually felt like I watched someone get shot in front of me. It was very well directed and very well acted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any of the violent scenes throughout the whole movie, um, I mean, they're 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 tense and tough. His, and like his face in, in the car after. Yeah. In oh. in his in his apartment as he kills that guy and the other guy's just wanting to leave. He's like, just, just let me out. And he's like, OK. And just like his like mind is all over the place. And oh, like and his, his laugh when he can't reach yeah. for the doorknob and the lock. Oh, Whew, man. man, that's a That's a tense scene, too. But yeah, that's I mean, all movie. all the violent scenes in there are like super Super chilling, to say the least. Also, Banner, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't it win Best Score, too? It had an incredible score. I believe it did, yeah. It was creepy as fuck, which just helped build all the ambiance. I love movies that you walk out of, and after you walk out of, you don't know how to feel. Right? Like, you're just kind of like, you just have this... And then... That movie, you walked out of, and you're like, did I I like it? Am I fucked up from that movie i don't even know <laughs> yeah, like, i don't i don't know and three months later dc's like or warner brothers oh you like this well here's birds of prey it's kind of similar like what the fuck are they doing it's kind of <laughs> don't worry if it doesn't do enough in the first week we'll change the title of it yeah that'll help <laughs> but that is number 97 wow. for me nice 
Nice. All right, Cycli, number 97 for you. This is such a weird jump from from, <laughs> from <laughs> Joker. <laughs> and I will defend this movie all day. I love this movie. It's such a it, it's, it's just such a guilty pleasure movie. I don't even care. It's School of Rock with Jack Black. Like solid flick. It is yeah. good movie. Just Miranda Cosgrove. So good. Yeah. It, it's just I don't even know. There's nothing about the movie that really is inherently amazing, right? Like it, it's a stupid concept of this just deadbeat who decides to substitute teach from his roommate because he doesn't have a job and he needs money. And he just makes these kids play in a band. And there's nothing about it that should make it as good as it is. But I don't know if there's anyone I don't even want to meet someone who doesn't like this movie. Yeah. It it, it it's just fun. It, it's just wholesome. Uh it's I don't know, it's a positive message at the end, like the whole scene at the end that leads up to them playing at the Battle of the Bands and the parents who are upset seeing their performances and the Asian dad says to the white dad, he's like, Hey, your son's very good. And he's like, No, your son's very good. You're very talented. And they're just like realizing that like there's so much more to being a kid than just, you know, being lumped in this category. And I, I've always liked Jack Black. I know we've mentioned Jack Black a couple of times. I think that he can be polarizing to a lot of people. I always like his music. I think he's incredibly talented. Mm -hmm. uh, but this movie also, to me, holds up today. I, I recently watched it. It's on Netflix right now. And I was enjoying it and laughing the whole time as I did when I first watched it. I think I, you smile through this movie throughout. And... Um, I don't know if I, I don't even know if I, it is underrated because I think when you talk to people, everyone loves it. But I just still don't feel like people talk about it, if that makes sense. I think it became a really popular Broadway play as well. I don't think I knew that. It's, yeah. a, it's a good flick and it fits Jeff Black. You know, he's like the slacker in it and stuff. And he's fucking perfect in that. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes when he was like teaching class, he's like, kids, I'm hungover today. OK, do you know what that means? One kid goes, I mean, just you're drunk. drunk. No, no means I was, was drunk, drunk yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> One of my favorite scenes is when he's uh, introducing the students to their instruments. And what's the girl? He's like, hey, you play. What's this called? And she's like, the cello. He's like, yeah, just turn it this way. It's called a bass. Cello. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know why that cracks me up. And then he's like, you three are, what is he? He calls them the, the roadies or uh, the, the groupies. groupies. The groupies. Yeah. The groupies. yeah, he gets groupies. <laughs> and she's like, I looked up what that meant on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing that that movie really had going for it, we talk about a lot on this pod, is they're all of the kid actors yes. were all really yeah, good. Yeah, they're really so, so good. It's really hard to find that many act, kid actors to go into the same movie and all do a great job like that to complement the just very polarizing and off the wall, wacky uh, Jack Black. Yeah, I, the kids are great. I, and it's sad to say, I, I'm not sure exactly who, but one of them passed away recently. I did read um, that, actually, yeah. Yeah, and, and there was a great thing online, like Jack Black wrote about working with them. I think it was the drummer. Could be wrong. Um, it, but it was like a bunch of the cast, like, all talked. And, you know, it's, it's crazy because it's been almost 20 years, which is insane. Wow. It was 2003. We're at 18 years in School of Rock. It does not Jesus. feel like that long. Um, I was in middle school. But, I remember seeing yeah, it in theaters, yeah. but I, I mean, I'm a big classic up. rock fan, so I loved all. I mean, that's a good movie. It, oh, it was the first uh, immigrant song. It was the first time Led Zeppelin allowed a song of theirs in a movie. Oh, wow. Wow. That's which was that's, which is pretty now awesome. Thor Ragnarok. Oh, yeah. Now they're just completely sold out. Damn you, yeah. Led Zeppelin. <laughs> uh, Richard Linklater directed it, who has done, I mean, a shit ton of stuff he did. If I'm looking at my know he's famous for a billion things. Um, the uh, yeah, it is a it is like an award winning Broadway play. I'm seeing now. I did not know it's a Broadway. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I I don't I'm not sure like how long it's been running, but uh, kind of cool that it spawned that. If the new generation of the people like watching movies now, like teenagers, like you know, have never seen this because they were too young, like I think it's just as funny. So Richard Linklater has done Dazed and Confused, Boyhood, Boyhood uh, man. Scanner Darkly, Before Sunrise, Before Midnight. So pretty. Uh, that actually, I guess this one sort of is a unique uh, entry in his filmography in terms of genre. His Boyhood was amazing. Yeah. 
cool. Glad the School of Rock got a mention here. Uh, Geiger, you got back to backs. You're 97. Yeah, um, so first 97. Cycli, you pretty much just teed up my next one with School of Rock, and so did Banner with what he just said. <laughs> so we will probably get a lot of these movies, and we'll always say it's tough to find kid actors. I'm going to talk about the OG, the original, the first one that ever fucking did it, and that's in 1970 something. Uh, the original Bad News Bears. Fan fucking fantastic movie. You go to childhood actors. This has to be rated R because they drop like three n bombs. It's extremely racist. <laughs> and very, like, and w- Walter Matthau is fucking perfect in this. I love the new Walter. one, I can't watch just because this one is so fucking good, man. It is, and when you talk about kid actors and, um, you know, basically just a ragtag team, and also the first to do it. I mean, the kids that no one wanted. I mean, see the Mighty Ducks. See pretty much any sports movie ever. This was the first one to do it. And it was done so well, and I, this is another movie that y'all have, have probably not seen in a really long time. And I actually bought on YouTube, it was last weekend on a Friday, and I ate Chinese food and watched the original Bad News Bears and fucking loved every second of it. Really fun, laughed the whole time. Dude, Jackie Earl Haley is one of the kids. Yeah. Kind of he's like Rorschach in uh, yeah, he's Yeah, they're... The kids are, I mean, the the fat kid is the catcher, and there's like a loudmouth shortstop that wants to fight everybody, even though he's like four two, and it's a good <laughs> flick, man. It's it's really good. Then you got Kelly Leak, who like smokes cigarettes and goes to Rolling Stones concerts and drives like a motorbike, and yeah, it's it's fucking great. Really, like in a lot of ways, set the table for, like at least the template for like sports movies going yeah. forward. Like, I mean, we wouldn't have Mighty Ducks if we didn't have Bad News Bears, and we wouldn't have a lot of Little giants, uh, little giants, or even like he said, School of Rock. We're like, dude, I mean, we can we can get this one star and pay him, and then child labor is cheap. We just got to find kid actors. Other movies have <laughs> done it, and you know, finding kid actors is hard, but it can be done. It is a formula that comedically works very well. Like take take a well known actor, put him with a bunch of kids, have him be like vulgar or just like yeah. really inappropriate around them, and that's almost like a genre in and of itself. <sighs> So next is my last one for the night, number 96. Um, so we tell stories, um, some of these movies. So in college, we walk into a bar. We're going to this big house party, and the bar's jukebox is broken. So they just had this, like, shitty TV in the corner turned way up, and they were starting to watch a movie. So we ordered a big tenderloin and drank a beer. And I've never seen this movie all the way through. It's, like, my uncle and dad's favorite movie, and that is First Blood Rambo. And we missed the house party because after our tenderloin, we just kept fucking drinking beers and watching First Blood. And I'm like, this movie is so <laughs> badass. And also, after tomorrow, when my hangover's done, I'm going to take my diet way better and hit the fucking gym. <laughs> but just the story of fucking Stallone just ripped out of the gourd, coming back from Vietnam to a town that doesn't want him there because he's got long hair and shit. And he just wants to be left alone. And then he just basically kills everyone in the fucking town, and, like the National Guard. <laughs> and Brian Dennehy... The other ones are okay, but this one is it's it's a lot more simpler. Like he's not going over to a country and killing everyone. It's just basically he's killing, you know, everyone a, in a, a small town, town that yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic though, especially when his commander calls in and they're like, Hey, I don't think we need your help to say he's like, I'm trying to save you from him. I know you got like five hundred, but he's gonna kill you all. I've had him in Vietnam. He's like the best killer I've ever fucking <laughs> seen. He's like he's only in there with like a knife and like a tree and it's like before MacGyver and he like gets Just all let these him fucking sleep. traps and shit. <laughs> Fantastic. Dude, Rambo Rambo First Blood, budget of fifteen million. In nineteen eighty two it made a hundred and twenty five million dollars. <laughs> it's so simple. And Man, if you're grilling a steak and just drinking, like, a heavy beer, this is a great movie. Like, me and Banner always, like, people talk about pairing beer and food, but me and Banner pair IPAs, food, and movies. And this is a great movie to just grill a steak to, drink, like, Miller Lite or something, and fucking watch this. I remember, this sounds like a perfect, I mean, it's only an hour 40, or hour 33 minutes. This is a movie commentary candidate if I've ever seen one. Literally at the bar, like, they had it turned up. We are just sitting right there, and it just started playing as we got our food, and we're like, dude, fuck this party. Let's finish this movie. This is pretty badass movie. <laughs> the party's not going anywhere. Yeah. Nice. Uh, all right, Cycli, back to you. You're number 96, your last one for the night. So I started the list with horror. I'll end today's list with horror. Again, kind of what we talked about, I thought this would be a little higher up when I started the list. Uh, and it's no insult to that it ended up where it did. There's nothing wrong with it. It just is where it is. It's well, the, the film screen. is insulted. 
the, uh, yeah, it, it should be. It's the movie Scream, the original Scream from 1996. Mm, nice. Oh, good. Um, and there's a couple reasons I love this movie. Uh, obviously, it's it's kind of brought back horror. Uh, first of all, the 90s were a dead period in horror. At least the early 90s were. The 80s were heavy in the slasher genre, and it disappeared for a while. At least the slasher side of horror did. Um, because you got you started getting more artistic horror in the 90s with like Silence of the Lambs and things like that. Um, and, and so not only did it bring back the slasher genre, but it like paid homage to the slasher genre. And so the movie itself, it was scary to me the first time I saw it at 10 years old. It's not an inherently scary movie. I mean, it, it, it makes now. fun of itself. It, yeah, kind of. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It, it makes fun of itself. And that's the point. It, it, it talk, it's kind of... Not to the point, but it's like uh, Austin Powers of James Bond. Scream literally does kind of that to the horror genre, uh, but in a more serious way, if that makes sense. Um, so the movie, what I love about it is not only does it bring horror back, it, it pays homage to the greats, but they did something pretty cool when they uh, drew Barrymore was the, f- the, f- the, the poster girl. She was mm-hmm. getting she was really becoming, you know, famous in Hollywood. And they put her on the poster. You think she's the main character. She hosts SNL. I remember that she hosts SNL the week of the wow. movie premiering. That's, that's, and, that's awesome. And what did they do? They kill her in the first five minutes. That's wow. interesting. Yeah. It's no what movie does that? And and to me, so I, I gained so much respect. Jeff, you and I always talk about in horror. We love the movies where they end up killing the people at the end, mm-hmm. right? Like, why do yeah. we love the strangers? They didn't get the, the people didn't get away and win. The, the fact that they put Drew Barrymore in this and then just five minutes she's gone, um, it's great. It, it brought on a lot of the tropes of like, you know, what happens in scary movies. Hey, aver- you know, don't go upstairs. The virgin's the first to die, that kind of thing. Uh, I think Scream is, can be credited a lot. If you don't know horror and you want to be introduced to the genre, Scream is just a great movie to watch because it, it just takes in so much. You yeah, said wait. it wrong, but I kind of want to promote this lie that the virgin is the first to die. Women well, remember that. Just go have sex. You'll you'll survive this Halloween. Yeah. People yeah, have sex, have sex so, yeah. Which they make fun of because the virgin, you know, that's, that's kind of the point of Courtney Cox's character. <laughs> Check out our movie commentary on that, too, because we definitely did it now. We yeah, that's sure that's dropping very soon. Okay, right. it hasn't even dropped yet. Wow. Okay. Uh, I think Scream, like you said, Cycle, it's sort of like a master class in how to handle meta because... Yeah. It's self-aware, but it uses the tropes in a way that it's not being like self-deprecating. It's not like, wouldn't it be stupid if we did this? It's like, I'm aware of this, and now watch me execute that trope to perfection is kind of how it works. Yeah, and that's the, I think that's exactly why. Like, If you're watching this movie and you don't know about anything else, it still holds up on its own. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's that. And then if you do, or if you are like experienced in, in horror, that makes the film even better. But, and, you know... Go ahead. I was going to say, is it Jamie Kennedy's character yes. who's sort of the one who's like the movie buff and the whole time he's sort of like pointing out like, well, this is what should happen if we were a horror movie. I was literally just about to bring him up. Yeah, he's the narrator, essentially, of the he's the horror fan that we are watching the movie. And I love that he works like at a blockbuster, essentially. Yeah. And he's and like, party, he got like all those VHSs. That he, <laughs> don't fuck he's like getting up. mad at what people want to rent. Yeah. <laughs> he's that dude. He's like the dude at the record store who's like, really? You fucking Beatles? <laughs> uh, and I believe this year we're getting a soft reboot of Scream, which we've been, we've gone back and forth about how we feel about those, especially in the horror genre. But uh, if it's a good movie, we like it. If it's not, then it's a terrible idea. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, pretty much smart either way. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Solid stuff. All right, Nate, you're number 96. All right, rounding out my five for war tonight. Um, and actually, before I move on to this, I cycle just mentioned a, a movie real quick. Uh, he said The Strangers in passing when talking about Scream. Not a huge horror guy. I think, honestly, I, I've said this before. The Strangers is the last horror movie I've seen. And my list isn't as extensive as uh, Horns over there, but Strangers did make 102 Wow. So for a guy who does not like horror films, because I think it's great. Scared the shit out of me. Don't like horror films. Don't watch them. But that made 102. So, damn. Solid, wow. solid That's flick. pretty impressive, man. Yeah. Yeah. You will not see another one on, on my whole list. So, <laughs> um, but in 96, contrast, mine is 370. 
for the strangers. Damn. Three. I don't like being scared. Me like either. So that should tell you how good of a you film it is. You should credit a movie for making you feel yeah. that way. I thought it was what. Anyway, <laughs> we'll we'll get we'll get back on track here. So '96, um, a Denzel film, which I hope we'll see some more. Like, uh, yeah, going forward. But um, I feel like one of his more underrated ones, uh, the Book of Eli. Um, Book of Eli cracks my top 100. Um, so post post apocalyptic tale of a guy traveling across the vast uh, desolate area with a book he's protecting to get it um, to kind of save mankind more or less. So um, Denzel, Mila Kunis does great in it. I loved her role in it. Gary Oldman, I mean, he'll probably pop up in the top 100, um, goes without saying, uh, for some other films. Um, but, I mean, fuck, I mean, I love Denzel of Death and so this was kind of a, a, a shoe in, um, but love, love the twist at the end too. Um, are, are, are we doing spoilers on here? Uh, because I now am really inspired to see it. Uh, and it's on Hulu, of course, <laughs> maybe don't spoil the. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for saying that because I don't give a fuck about spoiling anyone else. Anyone on here who hasn't seen it. Perfect. Um, yeah. there, there's a bit of a twist. Um, and it's great. You can kind of go back through the movie and there's things you can pick up on like your first time through. You don't know the twist. You won't know to look for these things, but there's a few things that, and then it makes the rest of the movie really cool. Um, and, uh, the book it, is Harry Potter, Jeff. It's like, that's he's protecting Harry Potter. <laughs> it's actually weird. He has Goblet of Fire, which is the fourth one. It's random. Just, I don't know why he didn't <laughs> this get it. it. Yeah, it's it's really it's actually weird. a Spanish to English dictionary. He's refusing to let people. Uh, yeah. Nate is is Denzel's character blind, if I remember correctly, or does he just wear the sunglasses as like an aesthetic choice? I mean, that's kind of the twist. He's blind. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he has the glasses on in the poster, like every image. Blended it out. I mean, people can wear sunglasses and not be blind. We're not. Putting a spoiler alert for a movie that was 15 years old. I was trying to protect Jeff, but if you already thinks or know he's blind, then yeah, he's blind. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's the twist. Uh, yeah. Ooh. There's a. Yeah, but Jeff, the saw music it. starts playing when you find out. <laughs> but pr- okay, fine. He's protecting the Bible, and they finally open the Bible up, and it's all Braille. So. Oh, that's and so cool. Gary Oldman gets it, and he can't read it. He's like, "What the fuck?" And then. Um, and the next two hours is Gary Oldman learning Braille. It's it really slows down. <laughs> third, <laughs> act, third act stop at the movie dead in its tracks. But uh, and then once no. he learns it, he becomes a Russian and tries to take over the president's jet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the prequel. And then the commissioner. The yeah. Off the but, Check out our Air Force One commentary. <laughs> Really good story. Um, a lot of good action in it too. Post like a post apocalyptic, so a lot of fucking just scoundrels going around that you're having to fight all the time. So um, great flick. Number ninety six. Ninety six for me. Nice. I just remember Denzel walking around with like a machete holstered, and you could tell he's like, I kind of want you to make me use this. Yeah, come on, say something, please. All right, Brian, you're number ninety six. Mine is uh, the first MCU movie to break the top 100 for any of our lists. Um, And with that being said, you could pull it out of the MCU and it doesn't even matter. Uh, And that is The Incredible Hulk with... uh, Nice. Whoa. Again, this is one that it was just very entertaining. I think think it is probably the best... what What have we had over the year? Four or five origin stories of the Hulk. Uh, played out on screen. I think it's the best one. I know a lot of people like the uh, the uh, Eric Bana version that came out a few years before this, but I like this. I think it's. Does anyone actually fun. like that version? Sorry, I'm not trying to interrupt you. I I, I thought it was I thought it was interesting how they made a comic book, but I think the Edward Norton one is way better. I, I thought it was like critically just destroyed that Eric Bana one. Yeah, it is b- sufferingly long. It, yeah. Continue, sorry. Uh, I just didn't know someone liked that movie. I think I may have mistaken Geiger for... Yeah, it was cool what they did for liking the movie. Yeah, I haven't watched <laughs> I think it that's what years. happened there. <laughs> uh, no, guys, it, this is the only MCU character to... Like, main character, really, to get uh, replaced or recast. Unless mm-hmm. you count Rhodey, I guess, but... 
Um, I yeah, I don't either. Uh, just a really good, really fun movie. Like I said, I think that this is one that it's a testament to the MCU where you could pull this out and it doesn't matter. You don't need this movie for other movies to make sense along the line. Um, but we have it and there you go. Yeah, that's a good point. You saying that it can be pulled out and still just stand alone is still a great movie. Yeah, it doesn't rely on anything and nothing else relies on it within the MCU. Yeah. Well, now, you know, we've had, spoiler alert, the Abomination just showed up in a recent Marvel movie and he's coming back uh, <laughs> in the She-Hulk series played by Tim Roth. So they are doing it. They, they, people say they've forgotten about it, but they have done a better job in recent years of bringing the movie back into the fold and how much money did edward norton lose by just refusing to play the hulk some more it's between just... three and seven dollars <laughs> jeff you and i have talked about this because i've always been an eric uh, uh, edward norton stan like i just don't know what happened to him it's weird i, I think he's he just was on top of the world with. yeah i think he's just difficult to work with like he wanted to direct the Avengers and the quote from Kevin Feige was like, Edward, we'd love to have you, but we can't have the Hulk yell cut. I mean, you, you and I have talked about this. Obviously we'll see this later in my list, but American history X and like we, we can right. talk stories so, about what got went down with that movie. And 25th hour may be on there for you. I'm not sure. I know you like it. No spoilers. All Good right, stuff. Jeff. I'm glad somebody gave it some love. All right. My last one. And Nate and I talked about this last episode on, a genre and a uh, specific time period that just overwhelmingly dominates my list. Well, this is the first entry there, and that's early aughts comedies. And I will round out tonight with the 2000 comedy Road Trip. Ooh, wow. Which, if you're talking like, does it hold up? I mean, it holds up. It Well, it, it makes me laugh still, uh, but if we're evaluating it like, inappropriateness i mean tom green is in it so there's some jokes that don't necessarily play yeah. as well but it's rent humor possible but the fact that someone confuses austin with boston <laughs> and they go to the wrong city and destroy someone's car because they think they're cheating on their girlfriend is stupid but really fucking funny to me and geiger i know you and i had a period in like the early 2000s where whether it was deserved or not, we were just kind of in love with any Sean William Scott character because of how vulgar he was. This was sort of like the 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 entry point into that for me. Uh, Brecken Meyer's fantastic, and this whole cast is really fucking good. I still... Uh, Tom Green had his place. Like, the first Tom Green show I thought was really fucking funny. Um, he's kind of not around anymore. I'm not really sure what he's doing, but... He really fits in this movie. He was He's on Celebrity Big Richard. Brother. Oh, yeah, okay. he was. Oh, right. <laughs> so if that tells you how his career is going. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes ever, and Geiger and I reference this all the time, there is – so, like, the – the kids are like going on a road trip and one of, they borrow one of the kids' uh, cars, obviously, because they need a car to drive. And through a series of hijinks, the car crashes because they try to jump this like destroyed bridge. And the kids' parents who own the car, they find it like a few days later with the cops and one of the policemen, or actually he's a photographer for the police department, <laughs> is looking at like the car that had like a wheel fall off of it. And he says to the parents, if I had to guess, I'd say someone was raped and murdered last night <laughs> the parents are like what makes you say that and he goes just a feeling <laughs> i love how tom green is like because we when we were in college like you know before we signed up or whatever we all had someone like take us around the campus and show us everything and tom green's like the tour guide that like shows you around like, why would he of ithaca college has no clue about the campus or anything he didn't even go there did he <laughs> Uh, he's never left the town. I don't know if he goes to the college or he's like an RN or what his deal is. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our first five of the top 100. Uh, I mean, we'll count it down throughout the course of the year. But as a five year anniversary commemoration, I think this is a great exercise and one that I mean, if it's worth the uh, getting eyeballs on the pot alone, it's to see what Banner will end up doing with the rest of his top 100. list. There's some doozies. I'll admit it. There's some doozies. Well, you started off with Welcome to the Jungle, Jumanji, so. Yeah, I'm keeping a running tally. That's number 90. I can't wait to see uh, 
the movies that don't make your list, meaning Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, is technically ahead of them. Godfather is like 200. <laughs> <laughs> I call it like I see it. That's what I, I'm just. It's his look, list. It is what it is. It is his it's list. list. Marlon Brando is so overrated. Don't even get me started. It's your dog. It doesn't count because it's your dog. There you go, Jeff. Road trip. It's your dog. Oh, nice. It's like looking Did you kill a cheetah? Off. No, those are her underwear. <laughs> Where are the condoms? Back left next to the tissues. Oh, good guess. <laughs> good guess. <laughs> Uh, All right, that brings us to the second part of our show, our protein shake, where we go around and talk about what's in our cup, all known as what have we watched lately. Let's just let each of us empty out everything, and then if someone says something another person's watched, we'll I'll just chime in for the sake of time. Gaga, why don't you go first? What have you seen since we last spoke to you? Um, I'm going to start with what we do in the shadows. I think it's something that everyone on this pod should watch. It's fucking Ooh, fantastic. The show, right? Not Great the movie. Flick. The show. Great show. Yeah, I haven't the seen show. the movie, but the show is fantastic. Yeah, and it just started off um, season three, and the last episode is on Halloween, which I think is fucking great. You know me and marketing. That's fucking fantastic. Great job. Mm-hmm. Um, it's on Hulu, and basically, they're if you've never seen it or anything, they're vampires <laughs> trying to just get along in today's world, which is just... A fantastic fucking feat. Great premise. Yes. And there's a, they have like a person in there who's like a butler that if he does really well, his name's Guillermo, that he'll get bitten and become a vampire. And he's like obsessed with vampires. So he's trying to like, basically his job is just get rid of the dead people and just open the coffins. Cause when they're in there, it's hard for them to open to wake up. It's shut, it's shut documentary style, like the office. So it's, yeah. it's great. They have the floating heads, they have the interviews. Um, and those are always some of the funniest parts in those shows. So is Guillermo like an intern for the vampire? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. And yeah. the funniest guy is the um, the energy vampire. And he's a different type of vampire. He actually is a day walker. And he works a nine to five in a cubicle. And basically he just sucks <laughs> energy out of people. So wears like, you know, corduroy sweatshirts and stuff and ask you about how your 401k is doing and you know water cooler talk that you just don't want anything to do with and he just like after you talk to him you're just like just zapped on energy and have no thrill for life and that's like his superpower and, and the people in the house hate him too because they he zaps them too like the real vampires and that guy's played i don't know his uh real name but he he's uh played by the character he's played by the actor who plays nate um in the office who works in the warehouse Mm-hmm. So, and I'll just talk about one more thing uh, since we got a lot of guys on here. But uh, AEW wrestling is fucking taken over. And if you guys, I know you none of you are really into wrestling, but if you just YouTube CM Punk's debut that was in Chicago, it'll take you back to when we were kids and it was like WCW Nitro NWO or the Attitude Era. Like he tore the fucking roof off the place, jumped in the stands. Like I sent you guys the meme where he's like out that he doesn't drink or do drugs and people are trying to pass him beer to chug and shit and then <laughs> daniel bryant just fucking debuted also and apparently they got bray wyatt too so if you guys were ever a fan of wcw i'd recommend watching either wednesday night dynamite or they have a new show called friday night rampage that starts at 10 o'clock and it's only an hour long so it is just non-stop fucking wrestling for an hour they just get in get out they might have one segment where someone's on the mic and then it's just non-stop action just for an hour on a friday night is cm punk maybe the biggest name to i don't want to say crossover because obviously their contracts like expire but to come over from wwe yeah john moxley was pretty big but cm punk was big because he hasn't wrestled in seven years this is probably the biggest thing that's happened in wrestling since the nwo if you can put your mind around that since hogan moving to wcw this is like the biggest thing that's happened in wrestling so Matt, as someone who uh, just likes to see, you know, industry disruptors, where, how close, or what would you say the market share is right now for AEW versus WWE? So they're like, still they- like relatively small, but they, the WWE had their second or third show, depending on how you look at it, on Wednesday nights, and they moved it and actually rebranded it because Dynamite kicked their ass for like eight months. And then Raw, like Dynamite has more uh, viewers than Raw. SmackDown is like the number one viewed show now on Friday nights for WWE. And WWE has released talent, like weirdly, like their top tier talent. And they think that they're selling, like they're going to sell the company. Like Vince McMahon's going to sell the company. 
He's done with it. Hmm. And he wants to retire. And none of his kids want it. It's likely so we have AEW the could AEW <laughs> is on pace right now to be the next WCW and you know top WWE in the ratings, which haven't hasn't been done since nineteen ninety seven. It's good, good time yeah, to be a wrestling fan. I like an industry disruptor. We've all agreed. I think competition breeds, you know, the best of both. So it's kind of cool that it's different style of disrupt- wrestling too. It's really action packed. I would call it like more lucha style. It's fun to watch. Nice. You got anything else? No. <laughs> Cycling. What is in your cup? We'll go quick too, since we have a full, uh, full amount here. Um, you know how I love A24 movies. I finally got around to seeing uh, The Green Knight that I'm came very, out. Very interested. So A24, if you don't know, is a studio that allows artistic freedom. They're, they don't, they're just a producer. They just, you know, allow the directors and the writers to do, they don't influence the movie. That's their shtick. Um, and, and so, so far I've loved so many of their movies because of that. Um, so Midsommar, uh, Hereditary. Um, the Lighthouse, Lady the lighthouse. Bird, Uncut Jam. Yeah, Uncut Jam, exactly. It, it, yeah. It's an incredible studio because, because of this ability. So The Green Knight was probably the first movie. I've looked forward to it. We got delayed because of COVID. Came out a year later. Um, was super excited when it finally came out. I, I'll, I'll just say this because I don't want to spoil anything. It, it was one of those movies that when it ended, I, I wasn't sure how I felt. But not in a good way. You know, like when Midsummer ended, you're just like you had to sit there for 10 minutes just before you could even get out of your seat to process what you just saw. It was more of a. I don't know if I don't get it. I don't know. And then you read about it online and you're still like, no, I'm not sure. You don't get it in like a plot using way or you're like, what were it, they we trying? to? What was do? the point of the movie is is really is really what I'm getting. <laughs> that's, at. that's a big part. <laughs> that's rough. Why am I here? Watching this? <laughs> and and I will I will say like, Question. you know, the, I... <laughs> like the movie itself. And I don't want to spoil anything. It's based off a, a 14th or 13th century poem. So there's not like a lot to go on in terms of substance. Right. These poems are you know, a couple minutes long. They make a two hour movie out of it. Um, it's it's well shot. The cinematography is amazing. The acting's fantastic. But, you know, it, it, it has everything that should be a good movie. Um, and then it ends and you're just like, I, I don't really understand the point. And then you can go on Reddit, you can go online and message boards and, and get people's opinions on it. And you're still kind of like, um, okay, yeah, I guess it was fine. So I, I, if, if you're intrigued by these kind of movies that you, you, you don't really know what you're getting into, I recommend it. It's fine. It was, again, well done. Um, but be prepared to have the same questions when it ends. Because I wasn't the only person online who felt that way. Um, Real quick, sorry, Banner and Nate. Uh, Aaron Kellyman, who was the head of the Flag Smashers in Falcon and Winter Soldier, is one of the leads in it as well. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, he, yeah. Again, everyone was great. I liked her. And it looked like it had a $15 million budget, which seems high. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, again, $15 I, I million think... dollars to me seems on the higher end for A24. I could be wrong, though, in terms of a budget. I think you can feel it in the movie uh, that it was taken very seriously. And, and I will tell you, there are people online who think this movie is unbelievable. And, and maybe I just missed it. So, you know. Go, go form your own opinion. Um, I also, of course, and I know a lot of you haven't watched it, if I try to influence you, is Ted Lasso, in my opinion, is the best show on TV right now. Um, if you're not watching Ted Lasso, then you're really just doing a disservice to yourself because... Yeah, I need to watch it. In, in terms of, I mean, it's you're going to see it win all the Emmys. It's going to get nominated again for the Emmys next year. It, it is... It's not a soccer show. It is a show about characters. It's a show about people. Um, you are smiling when you're watching. It's one of the shows that they can do a great job of being funny, but they can do a great job of just like wrenching your heart. Um, and, and honestly, I don't know anyone who's ever started the show and not liked it. I only know people who just haven't watched the show. So if you give it a chance, you're going to be addicted to it. You will literally be smiling the entire time. So we're about a little halfway through the second season. Um, 
And so, yeah, again, if you haven't watched that lasso, you need to get on it because it's it's well worth it. It's crazy to me that that one NBC Sports skit turned into this this show with so much depth and heart. It, it's yeah, yeah, I don't know who decided who, um, to take this commercial idea and do what they did with it. What I will tell you, I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, it's from the creators <laughs> of Scrubs. Um, and what Scrubs was amazing at was being so funny and then immediately turning on a dime and then just like making you want to cry because that was a hospital comedy, but they were so authentic to what life would be like in a hospital that doctor after right. doctor says Scrubs is the most authentic and accurate doctor show. Um, Your cousin, what, right? Who's a, a... Yeah, my cousin. And if you go online, um, it's consistent on the podcast that they have for Scrubs. They, you have doctors and nurses calling in always saying Scrubs was the most accurate. Uh, but the point is, again, that these people know how to write <clears throat> comedies with drama. So Ted Lasso, it's four bucks on um, Apple TV or just do the free trial and you'll, you will binge it before you have to pay a dollar. <laughs> so um, and really quickly, the new season of The Circle came out on Netflix. It's I'm about one to start it tonight. Okay. Uh, okay. So we were four, se- we're four episodes in. They release like four episodes every week, and every time you this new season starts, like you don't like any of the people, and then by the end of the show, you're like, damn it, I didn't know I was gonna like this person. <laughs> so far, because it just started this season of the circle, I hate almost everyone. I don't know who I'm rooting for at all. <laughs> so I'm seeing if anyone redeems themselves. I'm so far. I've loved season one and two a little more. There's been some things in this season, Brian, when you watch it, m- my wife and I were pissed, just pissed really? at what some of the, they decided to do. So it's still fun. Um, so go, yeah, go. If you want some guilty pleasure TV, go watch The Circle on Netflix. We all need a reality show that's just so fucking trashy that we're watching it all. <laughs> it's so stupid. Yeah, might need to. Uh, all right, Nate, what's in your cup? Um, yeah, I just have one, one real big one that I was going to touch on that I don't think I had before, but, um, other than that one that I'll get to here in a second, um, been catching up on Veep, um, in the fourth mm-hmm. season. Great. Hugh Lowry has entered it. Um, also Man in the High Castle. Also highly recommend that one. Uh, series is over. Amazon Prime. Um, and the fourth season on that one as well, which is the last season, which is getting pretty interesting. Um, but really cool take on if the Nazis won World War II, which I think I've talked about on this pod before. Um, those are kind of the two main ones. But the new one that I uh, just started watching recently popped up, was kind of iffy on it, wasn't sure. Started watching it. I think they've released four episodes. I think it's six total. we got two left that they're going to release later on. But – only murders in the building. Um, oh, Selena damn. Gomez, uh, Martin, yeah, Martin Short, and Steve Martin. You say you started it? No, I'm. A, I can't wait to start it. Yeah, it it's great. Um, it's really funny. Um, I, w- I would skew more towards comedy than like a dark comedy. There, there's some dark bits on it because it's about murder um and basically the three of the actors i just mentioned starting a murder podcast which is just a hilarious idea because on, someone was at, at the very beginning in their apartment building right yes and just the people who are creating this podcast you got, yeah selena gomez and then uh martin short and steve martin who are completely opposite sides of the spectrum and even their characters in the show even though they're around the same age um kind of have some uh different views and they butt heads a little bit but um really funny um i'm really excited for the season i hope there's an, another season that comes out after this i don't know if they're green lit or anything um but then also uh tina fey makes a bit of a cameo in it as well um she's another podcast host who they are uh intrigued with um it's not too much of a spoiler but the podcast she does is about a murder in oklahoma which um, is close to most of our hearts. So. Um, they're doing the typical Hulu model where it's week to week, right? Like you can't binge the whole show. Uh, that's what I think it is. I, we've watched four um, whenever we were watching it the other night. The oh, fifth wow. one, fifth and sixth weren't available, so I think that's how they're doing it. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay. Yeah, really so. recommend that one. Uh, really quirky, kind of off the wall. 
uh, concept and actors that they're melding together. Is it de- is there any murder mystery to it at all, or would you say it's more of just a dramedy? No, there's absolutely the murder mystery part to it. Um, okay, but it doesn't. I mean, it gets a little dark at some points. Like I said, murder is involved. Um, but really, what's drawing me in is just like the comedy of the whole thing, and like I haven't seen like Steve Martin in too much lately. Martin Short and anything, and like them together is just awesome. It's comedic gold. Yes, there's a reason it's worked for so long. Yes. Anything else, Nate? That is it. All right, Banner, what is in your cup? All right. Um, as I stated last uh, episode that I was on, finished my Star Wars quest, so I decided to start the MCU quest. I believe I was through uh, phase one at the end of that one, so I've watched everything up until Thor Ragnarok. I'm about halfway through Black Panther right now. Um, Can I interject real quick because I rewatched the Avengers? Okay. Uh, and I have to say, I think it, and I put this in my Litterbox review, my re-review. I just think it's a masterclass in pacing. I mean, for what they wanted to do there, culminating essentially five movies together, it's essentially like these characters get together in a room, and the whole second act, it's really just like them talking, which I think to like not blow your load as much as I'm sure like Marvel Studios wanted them to. And just have it be action set piece after action set piece. I actually really respect in a rewatch. Yeah, and I think that it that's what makes all of this work is that you get all the action and stuff in their individual movies. And so as long as you have one big action set piece at the end, like the Battle for New York, all the Avenger movies are always going to work with less action than their respective individual movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it the pacing, like, it really slows down in the second act, but it works. Like, just them talking on the helicarrier is pretty much the middle 30 minutes of that film. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Sorry. Uh, no, you're good. So I'm watching them in release order. Um, I am a sick person, so I'm thinking about when I'm done with this, going back and rewatching it in chronological order to sure. see if it changes my view on anything. Uh, Thor which the would Dark mean what? Captain America and then Captain Marvel, right? Would probably be the order chronologically. Uh, I think Captain Marvel's yes. first. Is there... Captain, no, Captain America first, Avengers first. It would happen oh, okay. in the forties, and then it is uh, Captain Marvel, and then probably after, Iron Man. Yeah, yeah it goes that, into, they're pretty close. Goes into Iron Man, yeah, and it all. Yeah, goes... in fact, three of them take place in the same week: Iron Man two, Thor, and Incredible Hulk. Yes, which we just learned on. That is the other thing that I watched, which, Jeff, I believe. Have you watched all the episodes of What If? I have. Yeah, let's okay. knock these out. So let's knock these out. Uh, let's start with uh, what's what episode is it? If uh, What If Earth Lost Its Mightiest Heroes, where Hank Pym yeah. plays a yeah. role. Yep, that's the one. That's, that was the f- second episode, or is that the third episode? Uh, I believe episode three. Okay. Um yeah. So that in that what if we learn that those three movies happened in the same week, Iron Man mm-hmm. 2, uh, Thor and Incredible Hulk. And I thought it was cool that they brought back like they reenact scenes from the Incredible Hulk. But Ruffalo is now voicing the character. Yeah, like, that was cool. You Edward Norton, you're dead to us. Go away. Yeah, it was. Uh, I kind of liked it, though. Like, I really I really liked it. Oh, I loved it because it was just something that we were used to and we. We knew it was there. I also liked um, the uh, the whole idea that they're the Avengers are getting hunted for what, before they're even the Avengers. Well, I was gonna say, Cycle, you might like this. So the what if, or I don't know if you know the concept. It's basically an animated Marvel show. They're twenty six minutes, and they say, what if this would have happened differently in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? And this one is before the Avengers can be formed, someone individually goes around and kills all of them. And so it's like a murder mystery, and S.H.I.E.L.D. Nick Fury is like, who the fuck knew I was trying to build this team, and how did they kill all of them? And he, like, reverse engineers who did it all. And all the voice actors come back. Like That's insane. That sounds amazing. Samuel Jackson, Mark Ruffalo, Tom Hiddleston, Jeremy Renner, like, everybody's back. Everybody was back. So it's cool. Yeah, I have to check that out. Yeah. Pretty much, unless you are in some sort of feud with Disney, the actor came back. You're so Geiger didn't come back. Geiger did not return, no. 
<laughs> still in that lawsuit. Uh, going on, what if Jeff? How did you feel about Doctor Strange's episode? So this was, what if Doctor Strange lost his heart instead of his hands? Oh, man, this one was interesting. So the premise, and again, I'm I'm kind of pitching cycle as we go. For this one is Doctor Strange and of course his love interest Christine, uh, not Everhart. That's the the broadcaster, but who's Rachel McAdams' character? Palmer. On? Christine Palmer. Um, she, in this reiteration, when Dr. Strange gets in his car accident where he loses use of his hands, she is actually in the car with him and he lives unharmed, but she passes away. So Dr. Strange keeps using the time stone to try and go back and rework the events of that night to where she is, um, uninjured or unharmed and he's unable to do so and actually ends up resorting to use of some dark magic, which of course fucks up like pretty much everything, everything universe i would describe this episode as straight up horror i don't think there's an ounce of levity or comedy in here and it didn't work for me not in the sense that i thought it was like too dark but it's just like there's no redeeming quality in it in the sense of like okay it's just like super super depressing which i don't normally hate but i don't really know what the point of it was like okay so now i just feel bad and doctor strange sucks and I don't really know. This is my least favorite so far of the what ifs is what I'll say. Mine, mine as well. And do you know if the zombies episode, just, I'm just going to roll right into this. It's no, going to have, it's a two parter, one. right? Has it's got to be. be. So cycling the Marvel zombies episode turns the <laughs> MCU into a zombie film where all of the Marvel heroes have been infected with this zombie virus, maintaining their powers. And at the beginning of infinity war, when uh, Bruce Banner is launched to earth of course voice both voiced by mark ruffalo instead of having dr strange be in the sanctum sanctorum he walks out onto bleaker street and realizes that the world has been ravaged by zombies hmm. you guys have actually made the sale like i i was looking it up i was like okay i need to i need to go watch this yeah uh, the zombies one pitch. is pretty cool and these are the last performances of chadwick boseman as well i might add <sighs> i i knew that part that's that's what i knew yeah. i knew he was part of something on disney plus now Thurman, I would say that these are probably somewhere, if I had to compare it to the Star Wars animated, I would say this is like Rebels. Well, I mean, I enjoyed Rebels. I actually watched the, I think the first, well, like five minutes of the first one, and then, I don't know, I got distracted and strayed away from it. But it was, what if... uh, Peggy uh, Carter was Peggy Carter uh, became Captain America. Yeah, yeah, basically, which was Captain interesting. Carter. So I'll, I'll jump back on these. Like I said, I started it and got five minutes in and that was a couple days ago. So I'll definitely knock those out at some point. They're short. They're almost too short, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I, yeah, I would love more. But my favorite one is, I think, the Star Lord one with Chadwick Boseman, mainly because Josh Brolin coming back to voice Thanos and what they did with Thanos. It's so cool. Episode. It's pretty so cool. cool. Thanos like the, is like comedic relief. Yeah, the jabs that they kept giving to him. It's so funny. Yeah. All right, that's all I got. Uh, the only thing I will talk about to close out Protein Shake is that I saw. It. It's getting very good reviews. And, you know, I'm an MCU stan, obviously, so take that with a grain of salt. But it's a nice, uh, you know, we haven't had an origin story, I feel like, in a while in the MCU. And this is good because it exists adjacent to the MCU. And then at the end, there's enough connective tissue that it, like, really is going to matter going forward. Um, but it was just really interesting to see what they did with the Ten Rings, which obviously has been in the MCU since the first film in Iron Man, as they're the ones who kidnap him. Uh, in the desert. Simu Liu is great as Shang-Chi. Incredible fight choreography. Two awesome uh, end credit scenes that really, really tie in big time to the MCU going forward. And uh, enough laughs in there that I think are appropriately placed that it works. So I would probably put the the Shang-Chi at like, Banner always talks about there's probably three tiers of the MCU. There's a top, a middle, and a bottom. I would probably put it towards the bottom of that top tier. Um, wow. It's probably slight, All right. slightly behind like Guardians and Winter Soldier, but I think it's better than movies maybe like Ant Man or and like uh, the first Thor, things like that. Interesting, so, uh, solid. Yeah. There. All right, 
last part of our show. What? You have a new pet? That bird signifies the question and answer segment of our show called Do You Even Lift Bra? And in the five years we've had this pod, guys, we've made a lot of memories from cycling committing acts of violence after seeing the actions of Kevin McAllister's uncle which were borderline criminal, to me trying to tell Geiger, who's worked in the beer distribution business for a decade, that Shiner Light Blonde is different from Shiner Blonde. Well, tonight we wanted to take a look back and each pick one moment from the pod that stood out to us as super memorable. So the question we will ask tonight is, what is your favorite or one of your favorite moments from the five years of the podcast? Geiger, why don't we start with you? So this is really behind the curtain, but one time we actually had a Bro Four Squad weekend where we all got together and um, we did movies and then we did more movies and then we went to a soccer game and drank and thought we could do one more movie. <laughs> and Cycli was so high that he thought we were just watching the movie. Like he didn't know we were doing the podcast and it was Back to the Future. And if you listen to it now, like it's a way different Back to the Future. We got rid of it. But literally, like, 45 minutes in, he was so high, just he thought we were just watching a movie. And I'm like, dude, you got to say something. Like, you're on the pod. And he, like, didn't even know. I, considering how much I like to talk. <laughs> he was sitting right by me, too, and the whole time his arms were just crossed, just, like, shaking his head. Like, yep, this is a good movie. I remember this part. Like, are you going to say anything? Oh, God. Just enjoying the film. Banner, do we, Banner, do we have that recording anywhere? I think I, we burned it. I think I don't think we have it anymore. Damn, I want to. I think we need to do some like B sides of Pro Four Squad because yeah. there's a couple we've never released. We used to think we were good when we we're all drunk, but if we're really hammered, only two people need to be on the podcast. <laughs> when we have like all five of us hammered, like it's not. A it good doesn't idea. work at all. It's a shit show. I remember being at that soccer game, and I was like, we're all pretty fucked up. I'm like, let's do a commentary after this. And no one had to wear with the all the soccer them. game. It was also OU Texas. It was a oh, yeah, it was. day in an amazing That's way. That's right. <laughs> it nope. was OU Texas and the soccer game. I was like, I am in no state to do Me and Banner did Pirates these. of the Caribbean and Toy Story. We called it an IPA breakfast, and we yeah, started drinking but IPAs we, at like 9 a.m. But then uh, uh, that Toy Story ended up not being able to get used because – we left an extra mic on, and so yeah. we had echo the entire Banner time. Banner sounded like he was in another um, room the entire time. <laughs> yeah. It sounded terrible. These are the things people at home want to know about, you know? Like, what's the nuts Literally, and Literally, Bro Force Squad Weekend, I think the... we did eight movies. I think we only we only published two of them. <laughs> yeah, I actually, that is, I'm just going to roll in right here. That is one of my favorite uh, moments, too, is the Home Alone movie commentary. <laughs> And this was, uh, like Geiger said, our first Bro Four Squad weekend. And obviously, I host most of the uh, commentaries. But Matt was like, hey, I'm going to take some of the load. Let me host this. We get like five minutes into the movie. He still hasn't said what movie we're watching. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think it was Horns goes, uh, we should probably tell him what movie we're, we're doing this commentary on. I think so we bought like with 90 beers and that first night they were all gone. God, we need to do that again. Yeah. I don't know that I can Definitely. physically do that again. It doesn't matter. Just one weekend. Yeah, again. it's fine. You'll be able to do it. Yeah, come on, dude. It's the playoffs. No one's 100%. Banner, you do have a great setup in your, and I know you might have moved things around, but your upstairs was like perfect. It was. Yeah, I did move things around. I have a kid now, so. Yeah. I think you had a kid got, then. I got booted. <laughs> oh, no, I guess he didn't five years ago. That's right. Kid takes precedence. Uh, all right, Cycli, what is your or one of your favorite moments from the last five years? Okay, ago? I'll, I'll give my favorite moment, but I, I, I'm going to mention another. Just It's not going to be long. Uh, my favorite moment is, I think, when I first kind of joined you guys was heavily more on the commentaries, just on movies that, you know, me and Banner and Hornacek, we always talked about, and I, I, I got brought in. And I think the, it was uh, Rogue One. Yeah. That I think it was the first time we all were involved that I got to be with the entire group. And I don't know, from the get go, it was just, it was just, we were all on it. Like it was fantastic. And the Empire one of our Golf, the, the, the scramble, the, the Empire Golf Scramble weekend <laughs> is 
is is is just to me because it was symbolic for me multiple ways because it was like it wasn't my first uh review but it was like it was just like i don't know it was just like okay this is like we're all doing it and then it was just like we just went and like 20 minutes without even talking about the movie we're just like <laughs> hole by hole what the emperor would be saying like with all these things and geiger is going off and it was such a it was so fun like i that that's one of my favorite commentaries just in general I, the great commentaries we've done about the emperor like wanting gimmies <laughs> Like he's like, you're really going to make about this? <laughs> like, yes. That's like uphill. Like you. <laughs> this is bullshit. Uh, I'm not long, but straight off the tee. That was a good that short was so game. Early on, it was so good. But an honorable mention is definitely the the Mighty Ducks commentaries with Banner just getting angry at. I just don't understand. <laughs> This living situation of the Mighty Ducks at the preparatory school. <laughs> Just fierce. Well, anger. some some of them were there, some of them were at home. I was I got confused. And an hour in, Banner goes, "Are these fucking dorms on campus?" I'm like, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> like, what does that matter? Getting hung up in the minutia. Yeah, I Actually, think this podcast is always was... best with Star Wars. Yeah, the second Mighty Ducks was great too because that's when the Hans Jans oh, yeah, the, <laughs> debate came in. Wait, who is, is it? Hans? I, I mean, still don't know. Um, I yeah, I, I think it's Hans in the first one. I never did figure it out. <laughs> that's good. Uh, all right, Nate, how about you? Um, mine is kind of adjacent to what Geiger was saying. Um, it's a different commentary a different person on the pod, um, but involve them getting blazed out of their mind and not know what's going on. So this was, and uh, I think I said this through text earlier this week. I'm not sure if this has actually been mentioned on pods or if like any of the listeners like know about this, but our hocus pocus commentary, um, we had several people, we had at least three people on. Um, but at some point, and I have a picture on my phone somewhere where this banner is just blazed out of his mind and he just has this, happy look on his face but he's just not a saying shitting anything. And grin, you yeah. should say. shitting and grin yeah shitting and grin almost looks like he's he, his screen is frozen on skype um but at the end of the day long story short he he forgot he was on a pod he thought he was just listening to a pre-recorded pod and was just enjoying listening to the other people talk on it um where yeah cycle for that thought he was just watching the movie Banner thought he was listening to someone review a pod. And he was like, just enjoy. Oh yeah. Okay. I love good point. I like that. Okay, cool. And then we finally just had to like kick him in the ass at some point and like get him back on to where he would say something. But it was, it was hilarious. And like seeing that transpire through the whole hocus pocus commentary was great. I and was I, just enjoying, I was enjoying the movie. The commentary <laughs> was fantastic. And I, Thank at you. some point I just forgot that, I was on the commentary and you guys, I think you guys text me like, are you, is your screen frozen? <laughs> and that's when I was like, man, this is a really good. Com oh shit. I'm on this commentary. <laughs> you don't have to defend yourself. It happens to the best of us. Sometimes uh, the movie's I just good. Remember, you just watch. It was me, me, I think it was me, Derek Fisher and Nate were all at Nate's house. And oh, I right. remember looking at Brian who had, he was just so happy. Like he was just, <laughs> perpetually smiling and we had asked him a few questions like hey brian like trying to get him back engaged what do you think about this and he almost had this face like it's so cool that they say my name on this one <laughs> they were oh, like no you're actually on it <laughs> yeah that's what it's like uh, like the kid who's athlete that's a good one that was a great one uh mine i we i think the recurring theme here is that banner is involved in all these but mine has to be on one of our movie month bro offs where we Take like two months uh, at the box office throughout the history of films. It could be like April of 2006 versus like May of 2012. And we compare the top three movies against each other to see which month was better. I'm not sure which month specifically, but one of the movies in question was Shanghai Nights. And we were all kind of shitting on it, Geiger and I specifically. And Banner comes in just saying like, don't you fucking say a bad word about Shanghai Nights. That was like the beginning of Owen Wilson's comedic career. And he goes off on this really well articulated diatribe, like <laughs> defending the movie. And then he realizes towards the end that he was actually thinking of the movie Shanghai noon, which Shanghai nights is the sequel to. <laughs> 
And then he said, you know what? Actually, I was thinking of Shanghai Noon. So I take back everything I said. Shanghai <laughs> Nights fucking sucks. <laughs> but it was one of the most eloquently put together speeches I've ever seen. And if you were a Shanghai Noon fan, it might even bring you to tears. Yeah, just but incorrectly then, uh, delivered, unfortunately. <laughs> And then when he realized it's Shanghai Nights, he's like, oh, I'm not going to die on the Shanghai Nights Hill. No. I fucked Look, up. I, yeah, I, I have a – there's a point where I, I can't fall on that sword, and Shanghai Nights is somewhere around that. Yeah. All right. That will do it for episode 160. Before we let the people go, Geiger, any last thoughts to leave the people with? Um, but we need to have Brian Banner shirts, and on the back it says, trust the science. I just thought <laughs> of that. A couple really hours good. before pod. Like that. That's perfect. I love it. It's got to have his face on it. Yeah, everything has to have his face. Cycli, how about you? Uh, I really need to pee. That's that's my last thought. That's beautiful. Is that Leviticus? It is, actually. 312. Damn it. Oh, so oh, wow. Uh, wow. That's kind of <laughs> crazy. The fuck? <laughs> We're just reading different versions. You have the King James, my, obviously. Yeah. yeah, yours is yeah. a little bit more wordy, so it yeah. drags out. Yeah. <laughs> I just that was impressive. After, after years, <laughs> we've been doing this together too long. Yeah. To quote the same fake <laughs> passage of the month. Yeah. Nate Thurman, the American hero. How about you? What do you leave the people with? Episode 160 and our five year anniversary. Yeah. Here's to uh, five five more years. And uh, Todd, the painting was a gift. I'm taking it with me. <laughs> what a great fucking reference. Boehner, <laughs> how about you? I'll pop out at the right moment. Don't pop out. <laughs> uh i'm just gonna say thank all of you guys the fans and my fellow bros it has been a fantastic five years and can't wait to keep uh doing it for another probably like three years and then i'll i'll probably be burnt out at that point if i'm gonna be honest with you well but that's honestly if, ends, so. if we made it past that swoon at like the see the year mark remember where it was getting really fucking tough i think yeah. we're just it's on, shit's on cruise control now. If we could yeah. do a Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla commentary 12 minutes before without subtitles or ever having seen the movie, I think this thing is just kind of on autopilot. <laughs> <laughs> Look, when you're when you're good, you're good. Uh, and then please make sure everybody pull over for emergency vehicles. You don't know who's in the back of that uh, ambulance or where that fire truck's going. Could be your house. Just saying. <laughs> I mean, I guess yeah. <laughs> is that a threat? <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, that's, yeah, that sounded like a threat. No, it's a promise, Cycli. Oh, <laughs> worse. Jesus Christ. All right, for the enforcer, Matt Geiger, for the legal counsel, Ronnie Cycli, the American hero, Nate Thurman, the mad scientist, Brian Banner, I'm the mayor, Jeff Hornacek, and we are the Bro4 Squad podcast. Thank you guys for five great years. We'll see you for another hundred years till we all die out, and then this is dug up in a time capsule somewhere, and people say, what the fuck was wrong with the human race? Not the climate change shit, but this is the issue. Uh, we're just a bunch of bros drinking beer and talking movies, and we appreciate all your guys' support. Follow us on Twitter, at bro 4 squad Subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you find your podcast. If you type in bro 4 squad as three separate words, and you can find everything we post and our squad blog on our website, bro 4 squadcom Till next time, we'll see you on Hulu, because that's apparently where all the good shit is that we just didn't know about. They have live sports. Bye.